The order, we have a quorum. Could we have the roll call, please, Mr. Management Analyst? Yes. Uh, Mayor Sticks? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Whitman? Here. Council Member uh, Rule? Here. Council Member Lang? Here. Council Member Francina? Here. Thank you. And welcome, everyone, to the April 9th, 2024 meeting of the Ojai City Council. Would you say the pledge for us, please? Thank you. Absolutely. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And is there a motion to approve the agenda? I'll move to approve it. Second? I'll second, but aren't we? Oh, no. And all in favor? Okay. All in favor of approving Aye. the agenda? Aye. 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 Okay. All right. Thank you very much. All right. We will move on to commission reports. And we have a report from Chair Smitty. Everybody? Yes. Hi, Chair Smitty. <laughs> I just wanted to uh, thank you guys once again for being so uh, 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 so supportive in getting us commissioners. So we're going to have the, for our meeting in April, uh, and hopefully Rachel will be there. It will be our first full slate of commissioners on the Arts Commission so we can move our thing ahead. And so just uh, five minutes before uh, you approve it, or 30 minutes, I guess, son, I just wanted you, uh, if you haven't yet had a chance to meet David Leeds, who you will be uh, 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 voting in as a commissioner, as our Fifth Commissioner, I just want to thank you very much. Can you tell us something about him? Because I didn't see an application in the staff report. Or maybe you could speak, tell us about yourself. Um, I stand here. <laughs> I didn't know. I was trained actually as an art historian at Harvard, and I've been involved in art and business both, actually, for my entire career. Um, I've been uh, in the movies. I've been uh, a writer, producer, and director of feature in a docudrama. Um, I've been a sculptor and painter. I have sculptures in many private collections and paintings as well. Um, I do some ceramics now. I'm still involved in business in some venture capital companies, technology companies that uh, I've been involved with for a number of years. And uh, recently moved to Ojai and three and a half years ago during the pandemic. My wife, uh, who I've been with for 25 years, has been taking me here ever since we met. She came here 45 years ago when there was only one building at the Ojai Valley Inn. And uh, I've done nothing but want to move here since she first took me here. So I'm very happy to be able to contribute to the community and look forward to working with you all and Smitty and the commission. Thank you. You sound very qualified, highly qualified. Thank you. <laughs> what I liked about David most, despite his great resume, was that he worked on he worked or works for a homeowners association on their board <laughs> for decades. Worked, <laughs> and I'm glad it's worked. <laughs> believe me, <laughs> because we want good commissioners, not just good artists. And, yeah. and, and through the mayor, I I just wanted to say that um, I I did not know that David Leeds was the David that I know. I know him to be a great community member um, and just a really swell guy. So you have that as well as t to the uh, qualifications, the, the personal qualifications are there as well. So welcome, David. Thanks, Linda. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Smitty, and thank you, David, for um, your desire to serve. We are lucky to have you. Thank you. All right, we will move on to presentation. We have a presentation from Dr. Bill Simmons of Broadband Consortium Pacific Coast and Vivian Vasquez of the Economic Development Collaborative. And they are here to facilitate an update on the Ventura County Broadband Strategic Project. So welcome, uh, Bill and Vivian, and thank you for being here. Um, good evening. I'm Bruce Stensley, President and CEO of the Economic <laughs> Development Collaborative, and I'm sneaking in as a stand-in for Bill Simmons, who's long been the coordinator of our Broadband Consortium, not able to be with us tonight. Um, first, thank you, Mayor Sticks, members of the Council. I uh, really appreciate your opp our opportunity and your invitation to be here. I um, want to do just a couple of things. I'm going to introduce in a moment, right while well, I can do it now, Vivian Vasquez is part of our staff, lead on a variety of things on broadband and digital upskilling and related programs. And Malika Ohm is also with us. She's our expert for the region in working on issues related to digital equity. Vivian's going to do most of our talking, but I'm going to kill a minute or two with you first. Um, before I hand it over, just a couple of things. First is a, is, is a thanks again 
Um, Council Member Lang sits on our board of directors. We really appreciate that. Council Member Francine has been on our board and is the alternate and really appreciate Council Member Rule's participation. Ventura Council of Governments, it's been a real partner and a leader trying to figure out how regionally we move ahead with broadband issues. And a little bit about who we are. So while I'm here as the President and CEO of Economic Development Collaborative, we serve as what's called the Pacific Coast Broadband Consortium. We are of one of about 14 regional consortia designated as such by the California Public Utilities Commission. Our charge is not to be anything related to delivery of internet service or broadband deployment, rather to be a facilitator, a coordinator, an advocate, a partner with cities in the private sector and other anchor institutions that rely on high-speed communication to make sure that we are effectively deploying fiber and high-speed communication resources and increasingly around what we call adoption, that is the ability of folks to access and work with the material effectively. Um, a couple of other things. Um, our broadband consortium is a three-county area, so we're Ventura, Santa Barbara, San Luis. Um, but we are most passionate, of course, about what we're doing in Ventura County. I just want to mention two things before I get out of the way. So one is that there's often a question, why are we still working on broadband issues in the 21st century? Don't we all have cell phones and high-speed communication? We did a study in collaboration with Southern California Association of Governments and Caltrans just about two years ago while we were still coming out of COVID, and about 25% of all families with kids in Ventura County do not have access to high-speed communication. And their kids are trying to go to school and try to do um, education online. And increasingly, we've discovered that we are wildly dependent on high-speed communication for working remote, for telehealth, for engaging in public service and government, and of course, education and public safety. But lastly, on my end, what do we mean by adoption? There's a handful of things that I could mention. I have them written on a card here somewhere. And essentially what we mean is fast, reliable, and affordable access to high-speed communication for all residents in the region. A lot of us can afford it, a lot of us have access, but the current providers don't reach everyone and they don't reach everyone affordably necessarily. And beyond that, what we're really talking about is the ability of low-income families to close the digital divide. Again, if you're talking about education and telehealth and the rest of this, without access to high-speed communication, you're really being left behind in the 21st century. I'm gonna stop there and turn it over to Vivian, who's got more information, and I'll stay on the sideline. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce, and thank you so much to the council for having us here tonight. Um, I'll just be giving a brief informational update about our strategy project, and I think Bruce gave a really great context as to why this is so important. Um, I'll ask for the next slide, please. In terms of what I want to share with you all, I just want to share a little bit more context as to why we're working on this project, and I know we have a VCOG representative here, so um, as you know, VCOG um, received some funding to be able to do this project, and so we're really excited to be able to be carrying it out and sharing more information with your city about where we are. So I'm going to give a little bit of information about um, what the Broadband for All initiative is at the California level, and then talk a little bit about what we've been doing for the past six months, uh, what the next couple of months will look like for this Broadband Strategic Plan for the county, um, what that timeline is, and then also what some of the outcomes you can expect for Ojai and for the region. And next slide, please. In terms of le legislation, I don't think I can say anything more than what Bruce shared in terms of just you know, at, at this point, especially around COVID and in the past few years, it just became so much more vital and important to think about broadband and connectivity for all aspects of life, for employment, for health, um, for all different areas and walks of life. And so California Broadband for All um, it includes a bunch of different funding sources, one of them being SB 156, which is how um, we were funded to be able to kind of think about what the strategic plan is and, and um, as Bruce said, make that plan for the region, not necessarily be the ones, you know, deploying it and putting the fiber in the ground, but thinking about how do we coordinate and make sure that we're thinking about the resources in the area and how to best um, work together. And next slide, please. In terms of the project plan and activities, our team has been um, convening a working group, a VCOG broadband working group um, since September. So we've been convening every month and we have um, Jamie Fleming from Ojai who's been representing, but we um, don't have an official member of the Ojai City Council or someone of your staff working with us. So we'd really appreciate having someone um, continuously who could be um, part of those meetings for the next few months as we finish out that plan. 
Um, but as part of those convenings, we've been bringing together this working group with representatives from each of the cities um, and the county to talk about what are the resources that you have, what, where do you want to be when it comes to broadband, um, and also just coordinating among uh, the cities to know who's applying for what grants, how can we make sure that we're working together and really capitalizing on the resources that are coming down from the state level, but also from the federal level that we expect over the next year or two. Um, in terms of data collection, we've also been doing a lot of that. We have an expert on our team um, working on GIS mapping who's looking at all the different internet service providers and what they're offering and which areas we really need to focus on when we think about um, making sure that broadband is accessible to um, underserved communities and making sure that we're prioritizing that. Um, although we do have the internet service provider data, we definitely also want to validate um, that with what people are experiencing on the ground because often there's a discrepancy between what's advertised versus what people are actually experiencing in terms of a download and upload speed. And so um, I'll talk a little bit about this um, later on as well, but we're doing kind of two parts. We have a, a need survey and then a speed test that we're doing. So we're more of an understanding of where people are, are getting their internet from, how much it's costing them. Um, and then also a speed test, which is just a very simple, you go onto a website and click one button and then it just gets the information about how fast your internet um, upload and download speed is. And that allows us to see what people are actually really experiencing on their computers um, or their phones. So you can do that from any, any device. So that's the data collection we're doing, and that data collection is helping us understand what areas we need to focus on um, when it comes to broadband. And then um, using that data, we've uh, been working on creating maps as well to think about what are the priority areas within the region. All this information, the convenings, um, the data collection, that's allowing us to coordinate better among the cities and to make sure that we're offering um, policy recommendations, not only that, but also just um, opportunities for collaboration and regional planning. Um, in terms of outcomes, we are working towards ultimately a broadband uh, regional plan, which will um, include an entire plan for the region, but then also chapters about each of the cities. And so we'll have a specific chapter about Ojai to talk about what are the resources and how is this community unique when it comes to broadband infrastructure and needs. Next slide, please. In terms of the timeline, uh, we're pretty far along the timeline, which is exciting. So uh, we've been meeting um, with the working group since the early fall. Um, and so we're kind of at this point now where we're doing a lot of the data collection. And so one of the things that uh, we'd really appreciate your continued support with is um, pushing out the need survey and speed tests. Um, so we've been doing that a little bit in Ojai and, and using kind of some of the city channels, um, but happy to you know talk about other ways that we can really make sure that we have enough responses from folks in the area. Um, so we're kind of at that point now where we're, we're still pushing for the data collection. Um, and as this spring comes to a close, we'll be using that um, to inform that strategic report. Um, in terms of the qualitative data, we're also doing focus groups and a regional um, convening, which will allow folks from the community, um, and we hope to have Ojai represented there as well, to talk about what's important to them when we think about the broadband strategic plan for the region. Next slide, please. In terms of outcomes for the region, as I mentioned, we really want to have this roadmap and strategy for the entire region with those pullout chapters for um, each of the cities in the region. Uh, but even though we want to have a report, and it's really great to have a beautiful, <laughs> glossy report, we want to make sure that this process is really um, bringing together a lot of different voices and that we're making sure that the folks that are you know, really experiencing a lot of the, the underservedness uh, of, with broadband are able to be centered in this process. And so digital equity is really important to us, and we want to make sure that the process brings together folks who maybe haven't worked together before or, or have an understanding of what different folks are doing in terms of the broadband space. So although the report is the outcome, the process is really, really important. Um, in terms of GIS mapping, um, as I mentioned, we've been doing a lot of data collection and we'll continue doing that. And so that will also help us create more GIS maps that are accurate representations of what people are experiencing when it comes to broadband connectivity. Um, and some of those we're hoping to make um, public so that way we can make sure that other folks have access to that information as well. In terms of the results, like I uh, mentioned previously, uh, we really want to make sure that digital equity and inclusion is um, central to the recommendations that we'll be making in that report. Um, and we also want to make sure that we're setting ourselves up in a way for the region to be able to be responsive to a lot of the federal investments that are being made in broadband um, and that we're well positioned and have a plan for the next couple of years as that money comes down. Next slide, please. 
In terms of what you're what we're asking from Ojai, we are not asking for any funding. Uh, we're just asking for your continued support um, in this process and just um, helping us center this issue and realizing how critical it is to so many areas of life. Um, we hope that you'll continue to participate in these conversations with us. And um, if you have a, a special representative that can be sent to our working groups, we'd really appreciate that. Um, and just continuing to support us with the data collection process and sharing out the needs survey and speed tests. Um, that's what we ask for at this point. And, and um, we hope to come back to you all in the coming months once we have the report finalized and we can share that process as well as the specific OHI data with you all. Next slide, please. And that's it. Any questions? Well, I just want to say thank you, Vivian, and thank you, Bruce. Um, it's so important, especially about the digital equity inclusion and getting th um, broadband to our students. So thank you for being here. Any questions or comments from council? Well, my, my only comment is that I have mixed feelings about all this because it's important that kids be, when you say, uh, broadband or equity, it's also important that kids be educated without depending on all of this. You know, I think we need to recognize balance and not make everyone overly dependent. You know, that's, that's all, but that's a, probably a separate conversation, but thank you very much. Yes, definitely hear that, absolutely. Um, through the mayor. Um, I, I very much look forward to your report, and um, as, as I remember, um, for Ventura County, your expectation is to reach 95% of the homes in Ventura County, and then potentially phase two would be to figure out how those others uh, would get would get served. But a 95% uh, saturation would be fabulous. So I, I very much look forward to um, the report and you know any support that we can give. And I, I don't want to, but I'll volunteer to be the, <laughs> the staff liaison. You know. <laughs> I will say that uh, I was part of building uh, the largest municipally owned fiber optic network in uh, Western Massachusetts. It was a collective of 26 small towns that decided to uh, take the state's money and build it themselves, which they did do successfully. So um, it's a great model, but this is also yet another great model. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Okay, we will move on to public communication. And just a reminder to the public, these are items not on the agenda. And because they're not on the agenda, we cannot discuss them. Uh, we appreciate, though, your participation. And we can agendize them for the future. So we'll begin with Ron Solarsono, then Hannah Drum Drumright, and then Dan McLaughlin. All right. Thank you so much, members of council. My name is Ron Solorsono, and I am the regional librarian for the Ojai Valley. And I want to speak with you tonight during National Library Week, which is an annual celebration highlighting the valuable role that libraries, librarians, and library workers play in transforming lives and strengthening our communities. Uh, from the American Library Association's website, quote, the theme for National Library Week 2024 is ready, set, library and promotes the idea that in our always online world libraries give us a green light to something truly special a place to connect with others learn new skills and focus on what matters most you can find your crew at your library's author talks workshops and book clubs no matter where you find yourself on the roadmap through life's journey preparing for a new career launching a business or raising a family your library provides an inclusive and supportive community where everyone belongs, end quote. So we have quite a bit coming up specifically next month at the Ojai Library. On this coming Saturday, April 13th, CSUCI Associate Professor of Sociology, Dr. Rachel Soper, will visit the library at 2 p.m. to give a talk titled Defining Regenerative Agriculture in California. Dr. Soper is currently writing a book about sustainable organic and regenerative farmers in Ventura County. Then on Saturday, April 27th, local Ojai author Joseph Puglia will return to the Ojai Library to deliver his talk, A Brief History of Westward Expansion from Thomas Jefferson Through the Manifest of Destiny. Uh, Dr. Puglia is a former college professor who taught English, philosophy, social science, and the history of Western expansion. Moving into uh, next month, into May, 
We're going to have another CSUCI professor, this time uh, professor of English, Dr. Bob Mayberry, who's going to visit the library at uh, 6 p.m. on Wednesday, May 8th, so in the evening, uh, to talk about who wrote Shakespeare. Dr. Mayberry will examine why the authorship of Shakespeare's plays is questioned, and we'll briefly look at some other likely candidates. Finally, uh, we will have local Ojai author Catherine Ann Jones visiting the library at 2 p.m. on Saturday, May 11th, to present her book, East and West, Stories of India. Jones is an actor and award-winning author of eight books who has also taught writing workshops around the world. Uh, that's all that I have for you right now. Uh, please reach out to me if you have any questions about your Ojai library, and thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Ron. Ready, set, library. Like it. It's cool. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, next we have uh, Hannah Drumright, and then Dan. Uh, and uh, we, do, uh, we do appreciate your enthusiasm. Um, I'm going to ask the, the uh, audience not to clap or make noise, but thank you for your enthusiasm. Um, Hannah Drumright, then Dan McLaughlin, and then Leanna McNeely. Hello, City Council members. My name is Hannah Drumright. I'm here to talk about the Community Development Department's um, decision to deny all temporary use permits and how it's affecting the small businesses. Um, as an artist born and raised in Ojai, um, I was surprised to find that there were no consistent artisan markets for makers and creatives. Um, so in April of last year, I decided to develop the space I was looking for and I started the first Ojai Artisans Market. And since then, we've created a collective of artisans here in Ojai that has really become a family. Um, our market has given back to the community and by providing affordable spaces to small businesses and um, working with local art stores, as well as providing free spaces to um, minors that are creative. Um, the vendors you see with me, and many that aren't, have utilized our market on a monthly basis um, and ex expressed their concerns as it's a consistent income for them as well as a meet and greet setting to gain customers. Um, the denial of TUPs in the city has affected our local vendors and prohibited us from continuing a market in a safe open space for vendors and customers. Complaints from downtown brick and mortars um, have been the source for the department's decision. While I agree there have been too many markets um, starting in our small town, I think that ours uh, has catered to Ohio, Ohio Valley residents and it helps keep money in our local economy. Um, we ask that the city council and the development department reevaluate the decision and look at TUP applications on a case-by-case -case basis um, and make the right decision for the entire community's development, not just businesses in the arcade. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, next we have Dan McLaughlin, then Leanna McNeely, and then Len Clave. Good evening, thank you very much for letting me speak. Um, I'm here because I have, I, my profession is I'm a building official, retired, and I do build, I work I consult in codes. Um, I had a neighbor who's disabled come to me one day and said all the work that's going on on 150, she said there's a lot of things that don't look right. So I went out and looked at them and I saw a lot of curb ramps going everywhere. So I called the city and I asked the city public works, what is your involvement? And they said, we have no involvement. It's out of our jurisdiction. So I went to our supervisors and their staff said, it's out of our jurisdiction. So I waited for a response from Caltrans representative and didn't get one for two weeks, so I filed a, a complaint with the um, Civil Rights Division of the State of California, and they put me on a list. So what I want uh, you to understand, and I left some pictures here for you to see of all the things that I noticed on 150, all the way from 33 to Gridley. There were uh, ramps that went into trees, there were ramps that went into light poles, there were ramps that went nowhere but the sidewalks, the path of travel that you use on the north side of 150, I challenge you to walk from 33 to Gridley. I did it with my wife in a wheelchair. When you go from Gridley down about a quarter mile, there is no sidewalks. So a person in the two hotels that are down there, <coughs> guess what they get to do? They get to wheelchair on the highway, which I don't think that's a good thing. So my logic here is if I can get the city and the county 
to start questioning Caltrans, which should have been done in the planning process, and it wasn't done, why not? Because the city is not going to redo those sidewalks. Even if, you was, even if you did, it would only be if somebody's developing those private lots. You would require them to put in compliant curbs and gutters. But not, you got one down there that's a, it's a sewer gutter almost. It's dirt and water, and people have to walk in the dirt. So if you're visually impaired, you're on a walker, you're in a wheelchair, good luck. You're not going to make it without going on 150. You go down to uh, Country Club Drive. You got a right, you got a curb ramp on the north side, one goes into a light pole, one goes into an oak tree. Where's the person supposed to go? You go across the street on the south side, it goes into dirt both ways. Why would, it, why would a government agency do that? They're never going to put sidewalks on the south side of Highway 150. On the north side, it's feasible to do it all the way. And again, I'm just trying to make you aware of the, the situation. I brought a wheelchair here if you'd like to try and do what my wife and I did. And my wife couldn't come. She's a, she used to be the planning director here at Interim. I worked here for a year as a building inspector. So I know the city. I've lived here 30 years. Um, but I think you ought to just walk it, see what I'm talking about, and see what you think. Because remember, we're not Thank you, Dan. Uh, next, we have Leanna McNeely, then Len Clayf, and then River Sav Savageau. Good evening, Mayor Sticks, Council Members, and City Administration. My name is Leanna McNeely, and I live very close to the City Hall campus out here on South Blanche Street. Um, I'm a member of Better Solutions for Ohio, a group comprised of over 60 neighbors of City Hall and the encampment. The purpose of our group is to encourage City Council and the City Administrators to seek a better solution for the homeless population than the one laid out in the grant proposal proposal, as well as to remind the council that the permanent residents around City Hall need to have their concerns heard and addressed. From everyone in our group, we do want to thank you and the city administrators who have put forth a great effort in cleaning up the encampment. The progress is steady and does allay some of the frustrations many of us in the surrounding neighborhoods have felt. The increased engagement by our city officials with the citizens has also been a welcome change and I encourage continued engagement. That said, there's been much talk about the needs of the homeless on the City Hall campus, in particular the need for security. There has not been a public discussion about the impacts to the surrounding neighborhoods. The encampment does not exist in a vacuum. The issues that plague the encampment do not stay on the campus. They bleed into our neighborhoods, sometimes with profound effect. We would ask City Council to public, publicly acknowledge that the current site surrounded by residential homes is completely inappropriate for the permanent location of this project. We would also like the City Council members to publicly recognize the impact the encampment has had on not just those in the neighborhoods, but the merchants in close proximity who serve those neighborhoods and all of the city. I once again urge the council to not take the easy and fiscally in irresponsible route as outlined in the grant propo proposal, but to continue to work with the county and other entities to identify and procure a site that better serves the needs of the homeless population without disruption to families and businesses that occur when camps are embedded in residential neighborhoods. City Council and the administ and administration must find a solution based on a long-term viable plan which can accommodate the growing population of homeless in our valley and one that will be physically responsible to all the, cities of, all the citizens of Ojai. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Leanna. And just a note to the public, um, May 14th, the unhoused encampment progress status update is on the agenda. Um, okay, next we have Len Clayf, then River Savageau, and then Robert Graham. Good evening, Leonard Clayf. I live in the city of Ojai. Uh, something like 40 years ago, I walked into a chocolate store in Solvang and saw a young high school student, an employee, dipping milk bone dog biscuits into pink chocolate. I thought that was really odd. So I asked her about it, and apparently I was the only person who questioned 
this practice. So I thought to myself, well, maybe it's not odd to put milk bone dog biscuits in, in, in pink chocolate. Maybe I'm odd for thinking it's odd. And I mention that because I sort of feel the same way about Caltrans leaving holes in six major intersections, six major curves in the city of Ojai. This is the third meeting in a row that I've come before you. Um, nothing has changed. Um, and as far as I know, the city has taken no action. So if you have taken no action because you think it's perfectly okay that Caltrans leaves holes in the major intersections, then I'll go away and I won't bother you anymore. If you, don't, if you agree with me that it's just dangerous and strange that they would abandon these projects, then if you can't do anything without first agendizing it, I would ask you to put it on an agenda. If you can do something without agendizing it, please send a letter to the local Caltrans, the state Caltrans, our state representatives, the governor's office, and there's a GOA, which is in, in Sacramento, which is the Government Office of Accountability, which is supposed to monitor programs like Caltrans. It, it's, it's beyond my ability to comprehend how a state agency could leave holes at, at, in, at, at, in front of the post office, in front of the pharmacy, across the street, at Chevron, um, and you, re you really need to do something. And the same goes for the fact that it's 35 miles per hour going through downtown Ojai only if you're heading eastbound until you get to uh, the Bank of America. 35 miles an hour throughout downtown is too fast, and I believe it's the only place in the United States where the speed limits are different depending on which direction you're going in. It's clearly a mistake. Somehow we should be able to light a fire under Caltrans to get them to remedy that. And, if, and, and I ask you to you that, that, that you gather all the resources you can, bring in as many people as you can, and fix it. Thank you. Thank you, Len. Uh, next we have River Savageau, and then Robert Graham, and then Pauline Corey, and sorry, I can't read that. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, River Sauvageau, and I'm here in support of uh, Hannah Drumright. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, I've been a resident of Ojai for 46 years and a small business owner living um, off my crafts, my art for 35 years. And um, I had a, a boutique uh, that was uh, in downtown Ojai for 20 years that uh, I made a living from my own designs. So one of the things is I, I closed my store downtown during COVID and I'm working out of my home and then I'm selling at uh, uh, the markets and online. And I am not able to place my work in any stores downtown Ojai. I can't get in those stores, even though I have had a very successful business here for 35 years. So the artisans market that Hannah started is uh, here for the local community, and she is fostering young people. She is also uh, creating community there, the kind of community that Ojai has a great reputation for. And many of the other markets that are in town, the other uh, art markets and artisan markets are run by people from out of town and they have um, artists from other places, from out of town, out of the county. So, um, so I wanted to uh, also say that uh, there are studies that having uh, art markets in a town does not take away business from the brick and mortar businesses here. And most of the brick and mortar businesses don't carry local merchandise. <laughs> so that's something to think about. And uh, even Ova Arts would not talk to me to have my work there. And I am a local artist here. So um, I just want to ask you to consider uh, Hannah's Market, because I think it's a great benefit to the community. Thank you very much. Thank you, River. Uh, next, we have Robert Graham, then Paulina, Corey, and Themis, Themis? I, don't, I don't know, <laughs> and then Larry Steingold. Um, and, uh, yeah, and um, 
Just, um, yeah. hi, Bobby. Um, if you want to, this is general public comment. If you want to speak on the consent calendar, can, uh, we're going to ask you to wait. Yeah, just wanted to introduce myself okay. briefly. Okay. Um, can do we, we should we wait for? Uh, yeah. Let's wait for pub. Can we wait for the public? Um, yeah, absolutely. The consent calendar. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Next we have uh, Paulina. And thank you. Appreciate. It. Sorry for mispronouncing your name. Yeah. It's not an easy name. It's Teresa Holloman. Teresa. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Um, we also have Ishel Gladstone and Carrie Sanders, and we are members of Dance Ojai, a 501c3 nonprofit here in Ojai that is dedicated to promoting dance. And I just wanted to take a moment to thank you all <laughs> for one, letting me speak, but also like your job looks really <laughs> hard. <laughs> I can't imagine like being up there. It often looks so thankless. So thank you for being in this position and trying to do your best to help our city. Um, I also wanted to thank this, the council as well as the Art Commission for the 2024 Art Grant that you all um, gave us. It's helping us to co-create a wonderful event on April 20th um, from 7 to 9 p.m. Carrie's holding the beautiful poster. It's the Ojai World Dance Festival where we're having a bunch of professional dance troops from Southern California come and put on a really lively amazing show um, so we wanted to make sure you all knew about it and wanted to offer you all tickets as we're offering all of our other sponsors um, like the Ojai Valley Inn, little small companies like Willow, the Rainbow Market, they're all helping us sponsor this event also and we offered all of them tickets so we wanted to make sure that all of you are coming and had tickets too so we wanted to let you know that was available to you. Um, did you want to say anything about the, the yeah, festival? <laughs> okay, um, so yeah, the show, that's really what we wanted to say. We didn't ha have any requests from you. We wanted to give you something and thank you and look forward to seeing you all at our show. Can you give us thank you. Dates? Thank you very much. Very exciting. April, April 20th. 7 to 9 p.m. at the Libby Bowl. Yeah. Thank you. It's going to be a great event, so we hope to see you there. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Larry Steingold. <laughs> Larry Steingold, then Star Child, and that's it. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I've been a resident here now for seven years. It seems like 50, and I love it. Uh, I want to thank you for the Becker Agreement. Uh, I was at planning meeting, and the homes are, apartments are going forward for affordable housing, and that's a good thing, so thank you very much. I really would like to know how much it has cost the town, the city, um, since the Simply Ojai lawsuit, how much in dollars legal fees and uh, staff time. How many, was it tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands? How much money did we spend when we could have probably gotten it then too? All right, um, on the Caltrans thing, um, Mr. Bennett is our state rep and he's running for election so I think it's time to call him on the carpet to get all the things straightened out. Also regarding the ATP, I understand it's going out to bid and I would like to know if we, the city, have the money to pay for it out of our pocket or are we hoping to get funds from somewhere else? Um, and the last, uh, I know I sound like, um, the last Falcon 9 launch was very nice except it turned my motion lights on in the back of the house and the whole house shook. So I realized that sending a letter to the FAA or to anybody will do absolutely nothing, but at least it shows that you have an interest in taking care of us and just a letter saying, hey, Mr. Musk, Mr. FAA, mm, can you do something about it? I don't know. It's a technological issue. It's, not, it's a science issue. It's not, son, son, sonic booms are going to happen. But some sort of comment to somebody up there saying, hey, this community is getting buffeted and I mean, I'm all for defense, I'm all for rockets, I think it's wonderful. But having an earthquake every week, every other week, I mean, is not really acceptable, and I had my first earthquake two months ago, so I'm new to this. So, thank you. Thank you, Larry. Um, yes, sure, uh, Council so Member. I just wanted to make a comment that, um, that, uh, that I'm planning on, with the, uh, being a part of the Tax and Revenue Policy Committee, I'm planning on, uh, 
mentioning the SpaceX as a, as a real concern. So I'm, I'm with you, Larry. Next we have Starchild. Good evening. I wanted to reiterate uh, some of the comments that Lenny made about uh, Ohio Avenue being sort of unpassable for pedestrians. Um, I walk often uh, across Signal Street uh, um, carrying my daughter um, from the post office um, to the library. And uh, there's no place to push the button to get the little white stick figure to turn on. It's always the red hand. And I feel like I'm going to get hit by um, turning cars. So that would be a great thing to add as well. Um, I got to talk to Lenny about it, and I also told him I was going to tell you about something that he and I might disagree about, um, which is about pickleball. Uh, so a funny thing happened to me on the way uh, to the council meeting today. Um, I went down to the pickleball court because I wanted to hear exactly how loud it was. Um, there was only one court going, two people from San Francisco. Um, uh, the lady kind of sounded like one of those professional tennis ball players, you know, making the oof when she hit the ball. Um, the guy was a little bit quieter. Um, but I stood there in front of uh, the neighbor's houses that are just facing the pickleball court. Um, and two were actually coming and going from their house, uh, from two different houses. And I asked them, you know, hey, what do you think about the noise? And both of them uh, said it really didn't bother them. Uh, one of them was uh, I spoke to for a really long time, a gentleman with a, a young child uh, like myself, um, and he said, uh, really, it's about, um, well, he said that it didn't really bother him that much, but also it's about people having fun. Um, I think when we live in community, uh, lots of people are going to do things that we personally don't uh, enjoy very much. Uh, for example, um, where I live, uh, there's a gardener that comes by with one of those gas-powered uh, leaf blowers that aren't legal in the city of Ojai. Um, that happens once a week. <laughs> and I don't like it because I work from home and, you know, I, I take a break for 10 minutes uh, while he's coming by the window. Um, but I think that's part of living in a, in a community. Um, the other thing that um, I think about a lot with pickleball is my grandma, who I just visited in Minnesota. Um, she lives near a pickleball court. Uh, she's 92. Uh, her friends play pickleball. Uh, every once in a while, she gets out there and she swings a paddle. Um, she doesn't play too hard. Uh, and I think, you know, it's great that um, there's something that uh, um, people who are somewhat, like, older or even a little bit disabled can do um, outdoors as part of a community. Um, the final thing that the person um, I wanted to talk about is the person mentioned uh, that the real problems in front of their house aren't, uh, isn't pickleball. Uh, it's a noise um, from the encampment and also uh, when um, the police vehicles kind of leave uh, the gate if they have to go really fast because um, their lights and sirens, that's the majority of the noise, um, not pickleball. So um, I just wanted to share that comment and uh, express that I signed the pickleball petition, which I heard about here first at City Council, um, and you can do it too. All right, thanks. Thank you, Starchild. Uh, any comments online, Will? Yes, Mayor Sticks, we have two comments online currently. Uh, the first is for Leslie. Leslie, please unmute your mic. Hi, my name is Leslie Hess. I live here in Ojai, and I just want to talk briefly about the last meeting and the public comments at that meeting. A correction of behavior is in order for council member rule, in my opinion. Sarcasm, rage, and yelling are unacceptable coming from a city council member. Committing to city council protocol, such as requesting acknowledgement by the mayor before speaking, and remembering to speak with respect to colleagues and members of the community may help. Yelling cannot be an option. In the past, we have seen this bullying behavior directed at high school and college students. This behavior can be corrected, but this behavior diminishes all of us that experience it. Thank you, and thank you, City Council, for the work that you do. Thank you, Leslie. We have one additional comment from Renee. Renee, please unmute your mic. Good evening, members of the council. Um, <clears throat> I am not here to uh, chastise any member of the council 
uh, for standing up for themselves, which is what I saw happening at the last meeting. Um, but I would like to uh, echo the comments made by River regarding Hannah's market. I do believe that that market uh, for local uh, craftspeople to be able to have a place in our town is a lovely addition to our town. And I don't know who or how they have to get permits to do things. Um, but I love the idea of local craftspeople being able to do a pop-up things um, at events. I grew up in Ashland, Oregon, and Ashland, Oregon had a robust uh, theater and drama with the Oregon Shakespearean Festival in their park. And they often had dancing events and singing events and pastry events before the theater started, which created a very festive environment. And I like that festival environment where people feel that local residents, citizens, young people have a chance to show up and um, participate in a festival kind of environment. And I feel like those markets do that same kind of thing. They allow local tra uh, trade and craftspeople to be able to show and uh, display their wares and interact with, with people who are residents as well as people who are visiting our town. So I think that's a great addition. I hope you can make that possible on a more regular basis. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. That's it. That's all. Okay, we will move on to the consent calendar. Uh, I would like to pull item oh, G. Yep. We, do. we also oh. have uh, three public comments on the consent calendar okay. as well. Okay. All oh, right. Um, I would like to, can I, I'm going to pull item G. Would anyone like to pull any other item? Hang on. Nope. Okay. Uh, we have three, four comments on item G. Um, so is there a motion to approve everything else other than G? I will well, make let's a do F and G. Oh, F and G. Are, are you pulling because it? They, yeah. and, um, can I remind you, um, I appreciate your enthusiasm, Councilmember Francino. Could you run it through the mayor? Just ask to acknowledge by the chair. Yeah, uh, I just thought you chair. asked us. No, no. Uh, <laughs> um, can you just ask to be acknowledged from the chair? So uh, you want to, do you want to pull item, which one? Yeah, F and G, they go together. Okay, I pulled yeah. G, you're going to pull F. Is there a motion to approve everything else? I'll move to approve everything else. Second. I'll second. All I'll in second. favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, all right. Uh, we have no public comments for F. Council Member Francino? Okay, all I want to say is that there, I, I feel fine about it because he was, the applicant was introduced by the chair. But if it, he had not done that, I would not have known anything about him because there was no application. So in the future, I think there should always be, the application, should, I, I'm sure it was just an oversight, so the application should always be included, that's all. Okay, yeah. uh, is there a motion to approve F then? Yes, yep. okay. and I'll, I'll move to approve. Exactly. And I'd also like to to make a comment about uh, Mr. About David. Uh, just really thrilled to have you as a part of the commission, and I had the opportunity to speak with him, and uh, I just think he's going to be an incredible contributor to our community and to the commission, and a huge asset, and fill a need that that the arts commission has. So thank you, uh, Chair, S Chair Smitty, and thank you, David, for volunteering and signing up. I, and I would like to echo that. Um, I met with David, and you're very impressive, and I uh, really appreciate all your skills and your background and your emotional intelligence. So, and thank you, Chair Smitty, for making that happen. Okay, we will move on to item G. Um, and I pulled this uh, because it's for the Planning Commission, and I just want to say, um, and I interviewed, we had five applicants, just a little background, and um, I spoke to all of them, and they were all very qualified, and um, I really am so grateful that we live in a community where so many people give back. And, um, 
And I met, and Bobby, I want to thank you, um, and I think you're wonderful, and I really appreciate your desire to give back to our community and um, your background and your intelligence. I uh, selected Kathy Lattes, uh, who has served on the Planning Commission in the past, and my reasoning is that um, Kathy has so much background. She is a planner um, extraordinaire. She's worked her whole life in planning. She has worked in every area of planning, including general plans and rezoning. And I think at this point in Ojai's history, it, we would really benefit from her experience, having an experienced planner on the commission who has spent decades uh, rigorously um, overviewing so many different plans. So um, I really appreciate Chair Quillacy and, um, and Council Member Rule uh, working on this. And um, it's, it's okay to disagree. This is what um, government's about, civil discourse. So it's okay to have difference of opinions. Um, and I appreciate the process that we, and this is where um, I stand. So um, any other comments? I like to yeah, comment. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, or oh, maybe well, you know, and actually, I, 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 can I, can I, yeah, we yeah. have public comment. So first yeah. we have Steve Quillacy, then Anita Cram, then Joe McDonald. Well, actually, you know, I should take Robert Graham first because you were here first, Robert, if you want to. <coughs> Thank you, everyone. Good evening, Council. My name is Robert Graham. Uh, as you know, I recently applied for the Planning Commission. I just want to say I would be honored to serve on the Planning Commission if confirmed tonight uh, and wanted to introduce myself. Uh, I grew up in Roseville, which is a small town or was a small town in Northern California where my dad was on the Planning Commission uh, and the City Council. And my mom worked for the City of Roseville in the planning, or the planning department working on housing elements. And so they instilled in me at a young age a strong sense of civic duty and I, I'm lucky to have them here tonight uh, joining me. Uh, in college, I interned in Congress, and after college, I did a graduate fellowship in the state legislature working on public policy. I have three bills that were signed into law that I carried, and after uh, the fellowship, I ended up going to law school at UC Hastings. I, I think Council Member Whitman uh, is a graduate of Hastings as well, yeah. uh, where I participated in the Community Economic Development Clinic. Uh, in, in that clinic, we worked with a housing rights coalition to draft affordable housing that was then introduced to the Board of Supervisors. After law school, I joined my parents down here in Ojai, and while studying for the bar, I met my now wife, uh, and we just welcomed our first child this past July. I just want to apologize if he's a little loud. He's just a, a bit excited. It's his first city council meeting. <laughs> Again, I'd be honored to serve on the Planning Commission. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bobby. Uh, next, we have Steve Quillacy, then Anita Cram, and then Joe McDonald. Thank you, and good evening. <clears throat> For those who don't me know me, I'm the chair of the Planning Commission currently, and one of the three members who followed the current protocol for deciding on nominations the Planning Commission. Uh, I would urge you to vote in favor of Mr. Graham. I would urge you to follow the protocol that you unanimously approved. Each of you voted for this. And if it doesn't return the result that you want in a given case, I still urge you to follow the protocol that you voted for. You've heard from Mr. Graham. He is an attorney. He is used to reading the kind of dense material that we go through on the city on the uh, planning commission. He has, as he told you, a background from his family in city planning and city council actions, for that matter. And, and I'll say this as a person who's on the other side of the fence, let's say, he's young. There ought to be a place in city government for 30-somethings, not just people like myself who are retired and have lots of time to donate to work like this, which we love. But I think we need an example in front of this city to show that 
people who are younger than retired folks actually have a legitimate place in serving the city and in helping to draft those things that the city decides on behalf of applicants before the various commissions. So I thank you for your time and I urge you to vote in favor of Mr. Graham. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, yeah, if you can just wait till I finish speaking. Yes, okay. you may. I was afraid he was leaving. Okay. <laughs> um, just to be clear, are there currently three planning commissioners? Because I missed the last meeting. No, ma'am. No, ma'am. There are currently four planning commissioners. Okay. Myself, uh, Mr. John Trent. Okay, they're all Judy still Murphy there. and Jamie Bennett. Great. So there's only one vacancy. There's one vacancy at the moment. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Anita Cram, then Joe McDonald, and then Starchild. Good evening, Mayor, Council, City staff. So I'm here to support Catherine Lodis for the Planning Commission. I have seen her in action on the commission. She actually has been on the commission before, so she has a good knowledge and basis for any kind of document that's necessary to be reviewed. I was very impressed with the way she handled herself, um, her judgment, and actually the meeting, one of the meetings that I observed her in, she actually offered a perspective and asked questions that no one else on the planning commission did. And those were questions that were very important in the process, were important to me, important to a lot of like-minded in the city. So I think that's really important. She has a deep knowledge and understanding of Ojai, a serious commitment to our community and expertise in planning. Been doing it for a long time and we really need that in our city. We have so many things coming at us from so many different directions that I think it's really important that we get someone that we know is going to represent us, represent our values, represent what the future of Ojai is, understands where we have come from, the directions we're going, and what's really important. So I think she will do our community well, and she will serve us very, very conscientiously from a strong point of view, and she will offer a certain balance to the committee that maybe wouldn't be there if she wasn't on it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Anita. Uh, next we have Joe McDonald and then Starchild. Uh, hello, City Council. Um, Anita pretty much said everything I was gonna say. Um, I'm here to support uh, Kathy Lottis for Planning Commission and I've watched um, her in the past on Planning Commission and she she's uh, really amazing. So I urge you to vote for Kathy for Planning Commission. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Next we have Starchild and then Teal Rowe. Hi, good evening. Is this on? Oh, good evening again. Um, I'm happy to talk about um, uh, Bobby for commissioner. Um, I got a chance to just meet his wife and his family. Um, they drove to the pickleball court uh, accidentally, at least his wife and his family. Um, so I got to ride with them and talk to Bobby walking in. Um, there are a couple of great things I think about his candidacy. Uh, one, he's a lawyer, and as we all know, the city is often uh, subject to a lawsuit. Uh, maybe as a lawyer uh, on the uh, planning commission, um, he could uh, do something to prevent uh, future lawsuits um, going forward. The other, uh, having a young child uh, himself, uh, like I have, um, I know that he's going to take a special interest in safety uh, for our youngest, most vulnerable uh, members of the community. Um, the last thing that I think is really important is his commitment to um, housing uh, for um, people of lower income. I think uh, everybody deserves a house uh, here in Ojai a who lives here. Um, and uh, I think um, his strong commitment uh, to providing housing for, um, or to allowing housing to be built uh, for low income residents uh, is very important. Um, also, just before I came down uh, to the council meeting, I, I got a chance to look at the paper. Um, I look at it several times throughout the day, and you have to, because uh, two hours before the meeting, right, um, they published an article just about about this, um, and they talked about a process, and gosh, I don't know all the processes at city council, um, who does, uh, but they said uh, there was a three-person panel um, that should interview candidates, and, and one of the benefits of that um, is perhaps that um, the people doing the interviewing um, can uh, inf inform one another, their questions can inform 
each other. And uh, I worry that if we have um, just one person uh, doing the interviews, um, that we lose something. Um, and so that I think, you know, the same way I like it if uh, council members go through the process of, of um, going through the mayor, uh, I, I want to also have the mayor go through the process. And um, so I think uh, if, we, if we follow one process, um, that's what we should do. Thank you. Thank you, Star Child. Next we have Teal Rowe. Good evening, council, mayor, and staff. And thank you for letting us speak because I didn't even know this was happening until I read it in the newspaper. So I highly recommend, I mean, it, I'm not voting for Kathy Lottis. I mean, it's not about policy, is it? Is it about anything to do with how somebody's so great? She's got institutional knowledge. We're always talking about institutional knowledge. She's, to me, been on the planning commission, so it's not just like some new, you know, staff person that we have to go through reinventing the wheel again. So I highly recommend Kathy Lattis. I think it's an awesome thing, and I'm so glad to be here tonight because I didn't even know it was happening. Thank you. Thank you, Teal. Uh, next, we have Larry Steingold and Nora Harold. I didn't know, I didn't know this was coming up either. Um, uh, I know I applied for it, and I was interviewed by three of you, and I think that's great. That's wonderful. Uh, in this particular case, the person chosen was Mr. Graham. And as somebody who is retired and old, -er, I, I do think I agree with uh, Mr. Quillacy that the city needs to bring in, let's call it new blood. I don't want to call it younger because that would be considered ageism or whatever you want to call it. But the younger, more, I don't want to call it energetic, but younger blood because there's a lot of younger people moving into town. And the younger people need to relate to somebody younger, not to a bunch of altacacas who are, sorry, <laughs> for those who don't understand, that's an old fart. <laughs> okay, um, but, but somebody like that. So I would go with the person that the review committee picked by vote, I'm assuming, they voted, and go with that because if you're gonna interject somebody at the last minute to overcome that vote, why bother? Why bother even taking an interview? Just have the mayor or whoever's sitting here with the majority vote on whoever the committee is and call it a day. Don't have any interviews. Don't have any discussions. Just do it. So I think you should, well, do what you have to do. But I would stick with uh, Mr. Graham. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Next, we have Nora Harold. Hi, Nora Harold, Miners Oaks for three more weeks. Um, so if I'm not mistaken, I heard something about protocol or policy and a newspaper article that just came out, and it sounds like this is about choices around interviews, and I'm thinking about what happened with the arts grants and how when that came up before you all, council member Francina was opposed initially. You all had discussion, and it actually went Council Member Francina's way. So Mayor Stix has come in with information, throwing it in. I believe she had those interviews with everyone, just as you all did. Yum. So whatever was printed, I didn't read the article, so I have no idea, but again, it sounds like maybe not all the information was in that article that actually happened. So I think for the health of the community, it would be great if we could hear about that and have that clarified, since I've heard some veiled attacks and kind of, uh, you know, bashing of the mayor, which we don't need. We just don't need bashing. We don't need it. It hurts our community. So Mayor Sticks has offered another name, and I hope that you all will talk about it in a civil and respectful and considerate manner. Thank you. Thank you, Nora. Any, um, anyone online, Will? Yes, we have uh, two 
<coughs> members with their hands up online. Uh, first is Michelle Ellison. Michelle, you're unmuted. Please unmute your microphone. Good evening, Kyle. Uh, while I appreciate Mr. Graham's willingness to serve our community in this capacity, I really, I really appreciate that. Um, since this commission is currently short on land use and planning expertise, however, Kathy Lottis is better equipped, I see, to fill this important role. As others have mentioned, she just brings decades and decades of professional planning experience, and she's been involved in our community civically and really committed and would provide much needed guidance on the general plan. So um, I know our community would benefit greatly from her service on the commission. So I encourage you to appoint Kathy Lottis. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. And we have one additional comment from Renee. Renee, please unmute your microphone. Good evening, <clears throat> council members. I was hoping to not have to speak tonight and have a smooth transition to um, a Mr. Robert Graham as our new uh, member on our planning commission. I didn't realize that all this was going on until I read the Ojai Valley News today. So thank you to the Ojai Valley News for bringing this to our attention. Um, Mr. Starchild, I appreciate all of your comments and they are very thoughtful and respectfully given. I do, it does sound like Mr. Robert Graham would be a great addition to our planning commission. Uh, it sounds like he's got the commitment and the uh, ability to uh, be committed to this kind of work on our planning commission. And I think we'd be really lucky to have him. I would like to see a younger member in our community as well being able to do public service. I think that's great. So I really do hope that you will support Mr. Robert Graham on the Planning Commission. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. Is that it? That's it. Okay, we will move on to discussion. And I did, do want to clarify a little uh, for the public and about the process. We passed, this city council, passed a new ordinan ordinance about how to appoint commissioners. Um, I'm not sure how many months ago that was, but. Um, and that process gives us the, the, there are three people who interview, the mayor, the chair of the commission, and a rotating council member. And the ordinance gives us the option to meet individually, to meet two together, or to meet three together. It all depends on what we request, what works best for us, and also scheduling and, um, and travel. So if someone's out of town, they can do it virtually. I interviewed all five of the candidates. I met with them for individually. Um, Mr. Steingold was out of town, so I spoke to him on the phone. And uh, we have used this process already successfully. We filled one spot on the HPC, Historic Preservation, and two spots on the Arts Commission, and the process worked well. And um, so that's sort of, I hope that answers some questions. Um, who would like to begin uh, through discussion? The, uh, yep. Through the mayor, I'd like to speak to the uh, process a little bit more. Um, as I understood the process, it would be that three members would be nominating, and this body would serve as a ratification of that nomination. Um, we, I, and I believe that the ordinance allows for there to be a second nomination if we feel that the candidate that was nominated uh, qualified. Um, I did never understand the process to be that one person wouldn't like the nomination and would therefore put up someone that they preferred. We had a committee of three. It was agreed that the majority would nominate and this body would ratify. Think about Mike Pence. It was ki it's kind of the same thing, only uh, we have a committee here that is saying, you know, we have people on this council who are saying, well, I have a candidate that I prefer. Therefore, the nominating committee's recommendation uh, is going to, you know, I'm going to put up another nominee, and that nominating committee's recommendation. Microphone, please. Um, that, 
that is what we talk about, you know, is this the process that we discussed? Um, we discussed the rotating council member so that each council member would have a voice in who came up. Um, I thought at the time it was a mistake to give the mayor the third vote on every council, but council member Francina uh, opined that it had worked always um, she opined that it worked always, but that was a different mayor. Um, if we want to talk about the actual uh, content, we have planners. Planning is not one of the uh, preferred occupations that is in the list of those for, this, for the planning commission, whereas land use attorney is. Um, and I, I don't want to go deeper into evaluating Kathy Lotus, Lotus and, and how um, I came to understand, you know, for instance, that she was not reappointed to the commission last time. And, and I did delve into why that was the case because it was of great interest to me. Um, most commissioners are routinely appointed, although my guess is that is going to change. So basically when we talk about the process as it was understood by this board, would be a nominating committee of three. If there couldn't be consensus, then the nomination would result in the majority. We have done that. Um, there is the loophole that any council member can nominate anybody. I mean, we did not take that out of the possibility. And hence, that is what is being used now. Um, I consider it to be a a travesty of the process. We all sat here and we all wanted to have an ability to have our voice recognized in the, in the uh, appointment of commissions. Not to be, you know, and I appreciate everyone who has come up and has uh, acknowledged that Kathy would be a great choice. Um, we see you come up all the time and acknowledge, you know, acknowledge positions. Um, you are you are here all the time, uh, basically, you know, acknowledging the same positions all the time. Um, the point being is that this process was meant to be a nominating, and this council was meant to be a ratifying. Unfortunately, that was not codified. And once again, I will say we have plenty of planners in the city. We have, we have very experienced planners who know the planning very well and have more institutional knowledge. Um, if we need to delve deeper and we need to talk about the characters of each and why they were not reappointed, um, we can do that. I would prefer not to do that. That is, that is why these happen, they do not happen publicly. Why these kinds of discussions do not happen publicly. Um, so I, I hope that people do understand the process. There's a nominating committee and a ratifying council. That's the process. There is a loophole if the nominating committee comes up with someone who's just completely unacceptable. But that's a loophole <coughs> that I believe is being um, taken advantage of, exploited. And it's there, so it can be exploited. So that then, once again, relies upon this council to sit and decide that they're either a ratifying committee as was originally uh, decided or they're a nominating committee and it is a free for all. You know, I can come in and nominate anybody and as long as I get two other votes on the council, we're good. Is that really the process that we have here? Really? So um, with that, I encourage my council members to remember how we, how we structured this com the, the commissioners and the, the, the deciding of the commission. It's a rotating council member. And if you want to rotate, if you want to choose somebody else when it's your rotation, fair enough. This is embarrassing to me. This is embarrassing. It's embarrassing that we have to put our potential commissioners through this. So um, that's the process. A nominating committee, a ratifying council. Is that what we have here? Okay. Uh, who would like to speak oh. next? Oh. I, I had my hand up. 
Thanks. Council Member Francina. Okay, well, I don't know why this is affecting me so deeply, but it is. My heart is just racing. I, you, we, we are in an awkward, in my opinion, we're in an awkward position of having two excellent, highly qualified candidates with completely different qualifications. Now, the problem I have is this. When I strongly advocated that the mayor be able to serve, on, uh, you know, on every, every time there's an appointment, I was a strong advocate that the mayor be the one member that was always on the committee. It never occurred to me that you would refuse to meet with the two other uh, people on the committee. That never occurred to me because that had never been my experience. And I have spoken to past commissioners and uh, when Johnny Johnson was mayor, this was never an issue. It's not specifically in the code because I believe that we all considered it the best practice that it would be a group interview that we could hear each other's questions. And especially in this situation, I see that you lost the golden opportunity to work with the chair of the commission who has served the city as a volunteer. His opinion needs to be respected. You can disagree, but you need to hear it. And, and likewise, can, Council Member Willie, it, it's a gesture of respect to work with your colleagues, whether they agree with you or not. And um, I would like to know why you refused to meet with them. It has nothing to do with schedules because, you know, as far as time goes, each commissioner had to meet twice instead of once. So, I mean, whatever excuses, what is the real reason that you refused to work with your two other colleagues? I mean, to me, that is a divisive action. It doesn't bring the community, it doesn't bring the commissioners and the council closer together. Councilmember Whitman? Wait, I need, I would like, I asked the question. Well, let's take turns. We'll okay, you'll answer the question and it's your turn. Councilmember Whitman? Yeah, so. No, I'll just ask it again <clears throat> if you don't. <clears throat> so uh, part of our discussion of a selection process was about the fact that traditionally, for as long as I can remember, back when I was on planning almost 20 years ago, um, there was a requirement that we have two um, members of the planning commission who are experts in uh, a series of fields related to land use. And so I'm gonna read that provision which we retained after much discussion, we decided to keep this in. It says, at least two members shall be chosen from persons having distinctly separate training and experience from the fields of architecture, art, building construction, civil engineering, land use planning, land use law, urban planning, or landscape design. Uh, when I served on planning, we had a ar uh, landscape architect and we had an architect. Uh, and the fact that I was a lawyer and could read land use law was not part of the equation. Um, be being a lawyer doesn't make you an expert on a particular topic. Now, I don't wanna say anything that disparages uh, Mr. Graham because I have every reason to believe that he would be an excellent planning commission. But my belief is that since sometime in 2022, our planning commission has been illegal because we removed somebody who had the experience that's required by our ordinance and they were not replaced with somebody with any of that type of experience. So I would like to read just briefly from Kathy Lattis' um, resume. She received a master's of city and regional planning from Harvard University in Cambridge, Massachusetts. 
Uh, she worked for over 30 years in city planning positions with the city of Laguna, L Laguna Beach, Costa Mesa, and Irvine, and also served in management positions for the city of Laguna Beach and Palm Springs. So, <laughs> um, I guess the other comment I'll make is that, you know, we're coming up on a general plan, uh, a pretty rigorous set of activities, and I think it would be extremely beneficial to the Planning Commission to have a planner who's been through that process serving as one of our Planning Commission members. Um, <clears throat> There are three terms of the, there are three of the current planning commissioners terms will end on May 15th. Um, I think what we need to do is appoint, the next two appointments need to be in these areas that are specified in our <coughs> ordinance. And then after that, we'll have the ability to appoint people who are more like at large. And, uh, and Mr. Graham may very well be one of those. Everything I've heard about him uh, sounds like he'd be uh, you know, an excellent candidate. So my strong preference is that we um, appoint Catherine Lattice, as our next planning commissioner um, because she fits the criteria that's spelled out in our ordinance. Um, through the oh, mayor, well, please. Let's, let's take turns. So, Council Member Lang, through the mayor, do you the mayor, I have a question well, of, of the speaker. We need to be able to, to well, respectfully this is, this question is, this each is, other. This is not a conversation. We go one at a time. And So please write your well, question down. Uh, we'll, we'll, no, we'll I, have a, I have a clarification that I need from Mr. From Council Member Whitman. Well, can can you hold it and we, you will get it? I would it. like it, it, uh, it's it's completely unreasonable for me not to be able to ask the, the question right now. Okay, the question is this: for clarification, May fifteenth is only one month away. Are you the next um, person to? Do we know who is the next? I have no idea who the next person will be making an appointment. Does anybody know? Uh, the, the city clerk did set a schedule, and I can provide you with that. I can go find that. Can you provide it now? Uh, I don't have it with me on hand at the moment. Okay. Uh, Mayor and Council, we'll look that up. Okay. Uh, Council Member Lang. Actually, um, in light of the fact that this was a consent calendar item, and uh, we've heard from the public that they didn't even know this was something they could talk about, I personally have not talked to... Uh, Kathy Lattice, I have not, I, 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 I personally think I'm going to propose or make a motion that we, because there are questions that are unanswered and because this is uh, questions about process protocols and also questions about a commissioner, uh, I would move to, to pause this decision and bring it back at the next meeting. Is there a second for that motion? Okay. Okay. Um, and um, I would like to ask a clarifying uh, question for staff because I did communicate quite a lot with staff during this process, and this is the process we adopted. Is that? Can we confirm that? Yes, uh, Mayor. Um, there, there was nothing um, outside of the process under which was taken by anyone involved that I'm aware of. I have talked with the acting city clerk I've spoken with the city attorney I'm not aware of any process violations that took place okay thank you thank you um, Through the and, and just um, one you know I did communicate quite uh, a lot via email with uh, councilmember rule and councilmember Quillacy and I'm always open for a phone call from anyone um, you know we disagreed on our decisions and that is normal through the mayor please yes um, first of all uh, I would not characterize your communication with the chair or myself as, as uh, adequate. Um, 
So that would be the first thing. Um, you didn't answer emails. Um, the second thing I would say is, is that we expected that norms and best practices would be followed. So hence, we did not codify every step of the way. If we now need to do that, it was understood by all of us that the nominating committee would nominate with the, with the majority and this body would be a ratifying body. I'm sorry, Mayor, that you would like Kathy Lottis to be the choice, um, but that is not the way this played out. And no, there's nothing that you did that is not, you know, th that the point being, we expected best practices, we expected proper behavior, we expected that you would follow the understanding, um, and uh, you, d you didn't, you didn't. Um, you've brought up your own candidate, and you have expected that this body will ratify that. Um, the nominating committee, including the chair, has brought up another nominee, majority. So what's the point if anyone can bring up anybody? And then I will also ask our city attorney a question, and I knew you were gonna do this, by the way. <laughs> that was just so clear. Um, city attorney, uh, is what council member Whitman has stated that we are in violation of the law given our current makeup of the planning commission? Once the council appointed each individual planning commissioner, the planning commission then takes all lawful actions and stands. The count, the uh, professional qualifications, once a commissioner is appointed and the relevant statute of limitations passes to challenge that appointment, the commission stands. The statute of limitations have, have passed to challenge all of the present appointments. Okay. Um, so let's say, okay, <laughs> yeah, okay, um, okay, let's just talk about, we have a council here who cannot make an appointment to a planning commission without delving into complete disarray, um, including saying that the current planning commission is illegal, uh, you know, I, I just, um, we don't need another planner on the commission, honestly. We have planners in the department. Um, one thing, I don't want to start talking about Kathy Lottis and the discussions that I had with her and why I chose not to nominate her, but I am willing to do that if that's what I need to do. Um, and that is so unpleasant. And it is so ridiculous. But once again, that is what this mayor has brought us to. That is what nominating when you have a ratifying committee. And anyone, anyone on this council who doesn't believe there were a ratifying committee is not remembering and is choosing not to move forward in the way that we agreed to move forward. There's a nominating committee and there's a ratifying committee. That was the agreement. I mean, you know, Councilmember Whitman, you were like, I want my guy. I want my guy. <laughs> that, was, that was how this whole commission unfolded. This whole debacle unfolded was I want my guy on the planning commission and I want to change the way the commissions are done so my guy can be on the planning commission. And this is where we sit now. Yeah, <coughs> yeah I, I would like to actually um, respond to that because we were given a choice as to the process, and we were given the choice as to what process works the best for us. And I chose to in individually interview each person. And what I have observed in the last 15 months with Council Member Rule on the council, when someone disagrees with Council Member Rule, then um, they're bullying techniques that are used pretty consistently. And so, what I've seen when there's a disagreement, there's name calling, um, there, you don't listen, you look at your computer when people are talking, you interrupt, 
You raise your voice. You have a whole you list roll there your for voice. me. You interrogate me or others. You point your finger. You misrepresent the truth. You criticize me or others. You question uh, people's motivation or intention. You accuse people of breaking the Brown Act. And therefore, I don't think that that, that is good for decision making. And that's why I chose to have the interviews on my own. Um, I communicated my my findings in a very positive way with both you and Chair Quillacy, and we disagree on the person who would be the best, you know, and it has nothing to do with any of the other candidates. Mr. Graham is lovely. We've met, I've known him for a couple of years. We met in the park a few years ago. I really feel that we need someone on the Planning Commission who's got a planning background. We have planners on staff, I'm talking about on the Planning Commission, and um, thank you to Mayor Pro Tem for Seeing Kathy's uh, praises and her background, that's just a, you know, her entire career has been dedicated to this. So um, I, the I think uh, I'm going to finish. Okay. Uh, uh, sure. um, so I think we really need to um, make good decisions, and this is about making the best decision, decision for our community. So if we can look beyond personalities and not make it a um, – you know, politically driven distraction, um, and just each of one of us from our hearts and our minds pick the best person who would be uh, have the most benefit for our planning commission. Okay, so let, let's take turns. Through the mayor, uh, let's take turns. Well, so I, I think you just you read a litany of of um, uh, person. Yeah, well, you read a litany of of attacks in a very nice way, which you were one to do. You did not say to us that you did not want to meet with me. What you said was um, uh, the scheduling would be best if we didn't, which was an out and out lie. Um, you know, that's what you said. So that was an out and out lie. Um, and, and so thank you for your very, your very uh, complete list of all of my failings, very much appreciated. It doesn't take, uh, nobody said that you couldn't meet with them by yourself, you could. Uh, your, your excuse was pathetic, but there it was. Um, and once again, I will say that Councilman Whitman can nominate Kathy Lotus in one month with you and with the chair. You have, you have the ability to do that. You have the ability to do that, and, and that's what should have been done. That's what should have been done. This should have been an easy, breezy kind of discussion. You rallied the troops. Um, once again, I do not want to talk about why Kathy Lotus was not reappointed to the commission. Ooh. Um, but I could. It's not, please. It, but it's just, it's just not something that I want to do. But there was a reason, and there was a good reason, and it bears, it bears weight on qualifications and, um, uh, and just the kind of person that you need to have working with four other people. Okay, Council Member Whitman, oh, uh, Mr. City Manager. Yes, Mayor, uh, and, and to all council members, I'm just speaking to you as, as your hired professional. I just would ask all of you, please, let's lower the temperature of this discussion. Let's limit uh, the amount of, it, of attacks and issues that are, that are brought forward. I think it's very important that we just have a calm, deliberative discussion. Let's please recognize that the mayor presides over the discussion. So that means that you do have to ask to be called upon. It is the mayor's choice whether to call upon you or not. So if you say through the mayor or you raise your hand and the mayor doesn't call on you, that doesn't mean that she didn't see you or hear you. Please just allow her to get to you in the order that she chooses, she is the presiding officer over the meeting. But I really ask that all of us please just calmly and professionally and politely finish this discussion for the betterment of all of us. Thank you. Council Member, or Mayor Pro Tem Whitman. Yeah, um, I do recall that we discussed whether it would take a majority of the city council to approve a commission, mem uh, commission appointment. Um, my memory might be perfect, but I usually have a pretty good memory, and that's what I remember us discussing and, and agreeing to. And uh, 
you know, we could have gone and stricken out those things that we don't need. Maybe we don't need an architect. Maybe we don't need a, someone in building instruction or civil engineering. Maybe we don't need anyone in land use law or landscape design. But we actually did adopt and approve of these special qualifications. And among those are land use planner and urban planning. And the candidate that's being proposed as an alter alternate to the one that was brought up is somebody who is an expert in land use planning and urban planning. So uh, I don't think it's appropriate to say we don't need a planner on our planning commission. I think uh, there are currently, uh, there is currently no one with a, uh, uh, land use planning background on the city uh, on the Planning Commission and I think that would be a good addition to this Planning Commission and just to structure uh, I would like to put a motion on the table that we uh, appoint Kathy Lattes to the Planning Commission Commission is there a second I'll second I'll put an alternate uh, motion on the table that we ap um, appoint Robert Graham but I'd like to explain why I'm saying that, okay, if I may. Um, first of all, when Kathy Lottis did not get reappointed, I objected to that. I felt she definitely deserved to be reappointed. I was very disappointed when she was not uh, reappointed. I didn't agree with the reasons that were given for her not being reappointed. But because there's going to be um, well, more, li more than likely a vacancy um, in May, there's no reason why she can't be appointed a, a month from now if that is the council majority's um, desire. I, 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 I appreciate that you explained why you didn't want to work with council member rule, but I feel <coughs> in my judgment, you lost a golden opportunity to work with her because I cannot even imagine in an interview process, you wouldn't be deciding on the candidate. You, you're asking questions, you're learning from each other. There would be no reason for her not to be on her very best behavior. So I, I'm not, I, I'm seeing this more as, I, I feel as mayor, you really need to make an effort to work with everyone, okay? That's, and I'm, I'm just, I'm disappointed because it makes me feel conflicted about, um, you know, supporting the, uh, your nomination. I just feel very conflicted about it. And I just, for that reason, I feel like we, we should follow the process and respect the choice of the um, planning, the planning chair and council member rule. So through the mayor, so are you for are Robert? For are you gonna make a, you yeah, make my a motion, motion is to appoint Robert Graham. Okay, is there a second? I'm sorry that it's been like this. It's very, is painful. there a second for that motion? I'm going to second that, and um, I'm going to point out that in one month, who's ever up can make whatever recommendation they want, and we can follow the process, and we can put an end to this very unpleasant situation. Um, okay, we have a motion and a second. I, yep. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I, okay, so I'd like to say a, a few things. First of all, I mean, I do think, I I do think this could have all been avoided. Uh, we have we have four positions opening up this month and next month, and um, and one of the challenges of the Brown Act is that we're not not able to talk with one another about who's going to do what, and and so I just wanted for anybody watching who's saying, ah, oh, this is uh, you know disturbing. There are aspects of the of the the laws that protect our right to transparency, there are aspects of those laws that prevent us from having cut these conversations um, in outside of a public hearing. Um, and so I don't, I don't know, there, so there are things that I don't know as someone voting on the planning commissioner uh, that were said or conversations that were had uh, and we could have really, you know, come up with a better strategy for how to, to appoint all the different commissioners that we have. 
Um, one thing that I was uh, that I was that I actually insisted on when we were developing the protocols for commissioners was the involvement of the chair. And there were a couple of reasons for that. One was we didn't want this to be a political appointee. And two, we had had problems in the past with previous commissions where the chair did not agree with council members on uh, an appointee and the appointee didn't fit. This happened in one, one instance uh, before we were elected into office and then we had to clean up that, so we had to be the intermediaries in that uh, situation. And then also we've seen just the different ways that that's been complicated. I personally feel Kathy Lottis has the qualifications. I think she's, she's just an incredible resource who has uh, extensive uh, history in planning and um, and she meets the qualifications that council member or mayor pro Ten Whitman was talking about um, and at the same time um, our the chair of the commission has been very vocal about who his selection is so I am wondering if uh, I mean, it seems like an opportunity. We have, we have, we have enough space, f potentially for both candidates. And and I I don't want to have to be the one who says no to Kathy when I think she is by far the most. She has the institutional memory. She has the qualifications, and I also. I'm really excited about Robert. Um, I had an opportunity to talk with him, and I think he brings such a great uh, amount of, of, of experience and skill. Is there any way we can determine who has the next, or that we can find the list of who has the next appointees, or the next nomination committee? The city clerk, the elected city clerk, has uh, not yet made available the list of of the uh, rotation as applied to all of the coming vacancies, mindful that there are more than just the three planning commission vacancies. There are several vacancies on I think every other commission coming next month and we don't yet have the rotation from the elected clerk for all of those vacancies. Um, the council could on that vein defer this consideration to be equal with the uh, terms expiring in mid-May and revisit the question then or the council can can take action now. I would make a motion to do that. So you're make. I'll second it. Oh, okay. Uh, so I, that's the okay. third. Yeah. I'm going to make a substitute motion. Wait, wait, wait. I didn't understand uh, the so motion. Can, can we remember to run it through the, I'm uh, sorry, chair. Through the chair? Can you? Can you? That's the third yes. motion. We I, I make a motion that we defer this decision until the May appointment. And, um, and then I think that's all I, ca I need to make. And is there a second for that motion? I'll second the motion. Okay. Okay. All right. So that's the third motion. And if I can add one more thing too, I I also just want to acknowledge that Larry is a candidate. We have great candidates, and so um, and so, it's a great problem to have all these amazing volunteers and and willing participants. Now we have a vote. Okay. Uh, roll call, please. Well, so and I, I, can and we like a discussion? Just, just one second. Uh, yes. Do you want to repeat the the motion? I, I heard the motion. I don't know. Are you saying that come May, there's going to be two vacancies, and then we can three, three, in addition to the one. That yeah, Mayor, Count, Mayor and Council, if I can clarify that point. On the Planning Commission right now, there is the vacancy, which is a midterm vacancy because of what happened in the fall. That seat is up in May 17th, 2026. So that's the seat under consideration tonight. On May 15th of this year, three more seats terms, four-year terms will expire. Those are the chair, Steve Coulsey, uh, Commissioner Murphy, I'm sorry, not Murphy, Commissioner Trent and Commissioner Bennett. Those three seats will then be up for reappointment or appointment of new persons as the council may desire. 
So the motion, as I understand it, is to con defer consideration of the vacancy, the midterm vacant seat, until the other three appointments are also on the table and consider all four seats together. Okay, I like that. I have one question. Are you able to see if these vacancies are one term or two term or how many terms have they served? Um, yes. The chair, Steve Quillacy, was first appointed in 2016, so that would be two four-year terms. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Murphy was first appointed in 22, so that would be one. Or And she, I mean, Murphy is remaining. She's up in 26, just reading the list. Uh, Commissioner Trent was first appointed in 2020, so he's in his first and only term so far. And Commissioner Bennett was appointed as a, a, a midterm appointment back in 2021, so he's in his first term as well. So Chair Quill see two terms, uh, Vice Chair Trent one term, and Commissioner Bennett one term, partial term. Okay. okay, well, we have a motion and we have a second. Any final comments before we have the vote? Mm. Uh, yes, I have final comment. Um, this seems to me, if three positions are coming up, those who want to vote for Kathy Laudis can bring her nomination forward and we can try to um, uh, resurrect or, or save this process that has just fallen into complete disrepair. Um, do that. Nomi ratify the nomination that was put forward by the nominating committee as you should do. And in one month, one of you can nominate Kathy Lotus, Lotus. It's, you know, if, if there are three votes here or three people who can't vote against her or four people, that's in one month. Please try to maintain the integrity of this process. This process was a nominating committee and a ratifying committee, which is why it was on the consent calendar and why it was not an item. It's a ratifying committee. Um, and you can s spin that any way you want, but that's what it was, and that's what it was meant to be. And we can, in a month, whoever's turn it is, whose ever turn it is, bring forward whoever you want. It's one month. I'm asking you to ratify the nomination from the nominating committee. Can we have a roll call, please, Will? Yes, Mayor Six. Uh, we have a standing motion for, for uh, a motion from Council Member Lang and seconded by Mayor Pro Tem Whitman uh, to defer the consideration of the unscheduled commission seat vacancy until the scheduled nomination process in May. Mayor Pro Tem Whitman. Yes. Council Member Lang. Yes. Council Member Francina. Yes. Council Member Rule. No. Mayor Sticks. Yes. Motion passes 4-1. Right, I, I do. Okay, let's take a brief intermission and we will back, be back with our discussion. Um, through the mayor, oh. I do have a question for the um, city attorney. There is something in the ordinance that says that if it goes back to the nominating committee, the same nominating committee is uh, is at play. In other words, so we will once again have the mayor, uh, the chair, and myself making a nomination. It's the same vacancy, the same nomination. The language you're referring to is in the staff report, which is the uh, clarification on the ordinance. The ordinance doesn't say that language precisely. What the ordinance simply says is that the uh, mayor, rotating council members, determined by the city clerk, and the commission chair shall nominate each commissioner, which must be ratified by the approval of a majority of the full city council. Ratified. Here, the consideration is continued. So it'll be the same nomination process, and uh, the same, the nomination of Mr. Graham will be on the table for the unscheduled vacancy, and then, of course, the council may act as they desire. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, city attorney. I'm going to go apologize to the okay, Graham family. We will family. take a brief intermission. Thank you.
Okay, if you could please take your seats, and we are back. Uh, hello, excuse me, we are going to begin. So if you could take your seats and come to quiet, please. Okay, we will begin with item number two, uh, discussion item number two, introduction of revised ordinance strengthening the city's prohibition on short-term rentals. Is there a staff report? Yes, there is, Madam Mayor. I'll be giving this one. Mayor and Council, what we have before you is a further revision and adjustment of the short-term rental ordinance. And if you'll focus your attention for the moment on the last page of the staff report, I tried to put some bullets for the key questions. First key question is, staff would ask that the council introduce the ordinance with the additional enforcement tools, which includes the increased fines requiring disgorgement of the unlawful rental revenues. Uh, on that one, the draft at the present matches what uh, Pacific Grove does from our city manager's prior experience, where it's the higher of the disgorgement of the unlawful revenues or the standard fines as stated. That could be an and. It could be disgorge the unlawful revenues and pay the fines. That's a choice. Uh, and then also whether to allow the additional tools, including collection via fines, penalties, liens, uh, among other re lawful remedies, whether to allow the private enforcement provision by aggrieved persons, whether to require the disclosure of the short-term rental ban to prospective real property purchasers. So that's the increased enforcement tools question. The second question is whether to authorize the city manager to put in the next budget increased enforcement resources, which would include um, increasing the amount of expenditure and uh, staff resources put into short-term rental enforcement. We have recently switched from uh, one company who is great in one of their skill sets and not so great in short-term rentals to a new company that I'll ask Mr. Siebert to speak about in a moment on the, the sort of strength of this new, the new company and where additional resources could be put to good use. Um, those additional resources would be paid for in part by the higher fines and revenue disgorgement. Um, mindful there's always some amount of collections costs along the way, but certainly the higher fines would offset a portion of those costs. And then last, to make the policy choices. At the present ordinance, the minimum stay length is one calendar month. Staff asked the council to provide direction on whether to leave it at one calendar month, to lengthen the minimum stay to 90 days or three calendar months, or to set it at another length of time. I know the community conversation has focused on keeping the one month, but revising it to be simply rentals must, are less than 30 days are prohibited. That has an administrative ease of enforcement. There's no questions about, well, what if a rental starts in the middle of the month? What does that mean? It's simply, is it 30 days or longer? Okay. Less than 30 days, so 29 or shorter, not okay. I know on that one, there has been some concern raised in the past regarding February, which of course is 28 or 29 days, depending on the year. And the answer to that is for a month to month to month rental, staff understands that February is 28 or 29 days and will not enforce against a month to month rental. That is not a concern that we need to specify in the ordinance, that's common sense. Um, second policy question would be if the, the minimum rental length is set longer than one month or 30 days, then to consider whether the several exemptions that came out of the prior discussion should or should not be included. The three exemptions that are included in the draft from the prior discussion are an exemption for one month rentals created by operation of law after a prior rental of at least three calendar months under civil code section 1945 which is the provision in the landlord tenant law that provides after a rental, residential rental of a year or longer, the, if it doesn't get renewed by a new signed lease, the auto renewal is at one month or whatever other term length rent was collected minimum one month, often landlords who had a one year lease and then you renew it, it becomes a month to month rental. Those have to be allowed if you have a longer than one month uh, minimum rental stay. Second exemption that was came out of the prior discussion was to exempt rentals of at least a month if the renter establishes domicile at the rented premises. And that would be if somebody does a rental uh, in which they intend to live up front as a month to month, allowing that. And then last, the, rent, the last exemption that was discussed previously is to exempt rentals of a month or more where the property is occupied by the landlord or a defined family members for at least six months before that fixed length tenancy and for which the landlord or their defined family members have a good faith intent to reoccupy the unit after conclusion of the tenancy. This would be the, the scenario that was discussed uh, previously where a Ojai resident uh, travels abroad or 
does a house exchange type situation where they leave their space for a month or two and would like to be able to rent their house out for that amount of time, but they're going to return because they still live there, whether to allow that exemption or not. On the three exemptions at issue, these are only necessary if the minimum rental length is set longer than a month or 30 days. Those are the, the key questions staff would ask for council direction from. And with that, I'll ask Mr. Siebert to speak briefly about um, the increased enforcement tools we're looking at, plus any other comments. Thank you. I'll just briefly speak to an agreement that we just reached with a, a company that actually the city of Oxnard uses, um, referred to as Rentalscape. They're a great company that um, uh, in interviewing and going through the process and, and before we even actually onboard with them, we had them kind of let us play with the technology and found it to be very useful. Unfortunately, the other company that we had been using for the last, I want to say six years, uh, we found to be inconsistent and just not not helpful in the process. We heard more no's and not existing, but when we would actually do just the plain research, we found that they actually existed on the websites. So Rentalscape, on the other hand, we're finding um, a lot of consistency and a lot of a breath of, of sigh of relief in terms of us doing the due diligence and also having um, you know community development staff um, and doing their research, finding a lot of um, positive uh, reinforcement um, in terms of going after some of these delinquent and um, illegal um, uh, short-term rentals. So, any questions from council? Uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Yeah. Um, <coughs> so, I think there's a fairly strong uh, majority here and community support for the idea of um, short-term rentals not being great for the community. And the question is, how do we enforce our rules? And so I guess my, my question is, um, what can you know what can we adopt to make your job more easier you know to accomplish what we're trying to accomplish the I, first answer to that would be to adopt the provisions that are the additional enforcement tools in section 42405 as drafted and if the council wanted to strengthen them further beyond the draft it would be to revise subsection uh, c to provide that the disgorgement of unlawful revenue would be in addition to the uh, fines, not whichever is greater. And through the mayor, if I could just jump in to add to that, I, I would actually add a couple yeah, go things. I, I would, <coughs> you, have, you have a goal setting session uh, next week. Um, I think that if you're so inclined and you wanted to dedicate additional resources uh, it'd be appropriate to make that an objective within a goal next week and to direct us to allocate uh, some funding for, you know, either a contract or a part-time employee. Because really, I mean, yes, the, the city attorney is correct. Uh, having all the words there is totally helpful. But the bottom line is you really, you know, we have somebody working internally using the software and, and doing this, but this person also has other job duties too. And so, in the end of the day, you know, it's if it really is um, a council priority, then yeah, have have your spending plan reflect that. Thank you. Any other questions? Just wanted to go back to Matt on on his response uh, to translate because I have actually been using page five of your report more so than the code itself, and that mm -hmm. second question. Staff asks City Council to confirm the addition of some, all, or none of the uh, enforcement tools. So all of these questions that are below, if we adopt these, that's what you were referring to with, you know, 4-24. Uh, yeah, I kind of lost uh, when you started talking numbers. Yeah. I was yeah, so each of those bullets on, on that section Staff asks the council to confirm the addition of some, all, or none of these enforcement tools. Those are embodied in that section in the ordinance on pages uh, 2-12 through 
uh, 2-14. Councilmember Lang. I have a question. Uh, so uh, so the, in the county, short-term rentals are prohibited, correct? Uh, is that correct? Yes, with the possible exception of the coastal zone portion of the county. Oh, okay. Coastal zone has separate zoning, and the Coastal Commission is very, currently is very pro-short-term rental. But for the non-coastal zone part of the county, short-term rentals are prohibited, and that includes the unincorporated Ohio Valley. And how do you do you have any idea how they define short term rentals in the county? I, 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 I'm only think it, if you don't, it's it's OK. I just was wondering. My understanding is that the county definition is is 30 day minimum rental length. OK. And and so how would that um, how would that affect any ordinance that we would put into place? Like, does the county have have any kind of enforcement that we could tap into or that we could draw from? We could certainly have a conversation with the county in partnering on enforcement tools. I'm not quite sure what the county does in terms of enforcement, but we could have that conversation with them. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's move on to public comment. Uh, first we have Nora Harold, then Tara Jeffrey, and then Anita Cram. Well, I'm so glad you asked that question um, because I was having dinner the other night and the couple at the table next to us, we start talking and they said, oh, we're staying at this little Airbnb. I said, oh, yeah, where is it? And they said, Miner's Road, which is just over the border of Ojai into Miner's Oaks, my neighborhood. So I thought, what is the county doing and how can the city and the county collaborate here to facilitate the health and well-being of housing in our valley? Because I know that I'm losing my home in part to STRs. I know it. I mean, my neighbor the other day was crowing about how she's going to have a 30-day STR two doors down from me, right? So whatever you all can do, to make enforcement work. So if that's 30 days and that's best, right? That's a tough question, I think, because I'm way on board with like 90 day <laughs> minimum. But if 30 days is doable and then you revisit this once you have enforcement under control and lengthen that stay, yes. I've already said everything else about this, you know. So I love you all and appreciate your work and um, just appreciate your consistency in providing housing for those who are most in need here. Thanks. Thank you, Nora. Next, we have Tara Jeffrey, then Anita Cram, and then Larry Steinkold. Hi there. Thank you, guys. Um, I was going to say all this great stuff, and now I'm not going to say any of it because it's already been said, <laughs> um, except a couple of things. I, I just, I've been at this for a long time, since 2016. Um, I think if there's not going to be an enforcement, then you should just make them illegal across the board. If you can't do it, might be impossible, might not be able to be done, then just make them all illegal. I just don't see... Since 2016, we've been at this, and really, it's just getting worse. So I'm kind of not uh, having a lot of confidence in the ability to, to regulate these things. So um, I also wanted to um, talk about the carve-out that was discussed. And the rub here for me is that what if people use this as a way uh, to rent to short-term tourists? What if guests are now called tenants? It appears to be a way to get around having to follow the rules that everyone else is expected to comply with. One of the reasons STRs are so hard to enforce is that owners find sophisticated ways to get around the system, and this could turn into yet another way to do it. Having a tenant is a different story. They are not tourists and have regular contract with the landlord. You are a tenant, not a guest. So I guess it depends on the intentions of the landlord slash homeowner and if they are honest or using certain language to get around the ordinance. Another problem with enforcement is the onus is on the neighbors who are fearful of turning in other neighbors. This is really unfair to put this kind of pressure on people when all they want to do is just be able to live in peace and not have to deal with tourism in their homes and neighborhoods. By not enforcing the ordinance, 
there has been an environment of fear and dishonesty created. There needs to be a much tighter restraints on this, or if it's too difficult to handle, as I mentioned before, just make them all illegal. Um, we have to put up with this since 2016, along with the rest of the huge influx of tourism with its traffic, noise, littering, and congestion. I feel the priorities of the city need to balance in the direction of its residents for a change. Constant kowtowing to tourism make it, is making this town a bit of a crass parody of itself. We need to swing that pendulum the other direction for balance. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. Next, we have Anita Cram, then Larry Steingold, then Jennifer Fleischman. Hello again. So I can see by reading the staff report, you put a lot of good work in this, and there's a lot of good things in it. So thank you very much, staff, for uh, what you did in this, in this staff report. I think the three months should be the minimum. Um, so I really like the three months part. Uh, the increase in fines is great, and I think disgorgement should be in addition to the fines. I think these people need to pay. It's decimating our community, has decimated our community, still is, and still will into the future. So I think, you know, as I think this one month exemption part is a real sticky wicket here because there are so many ways it can be abused. You know, there's nothing to stop someone from saying, oh, yeah, this is my home. I've established domicile here, but I'm going to come for a weekend and then rent for a month, and I'm going to come back for a day and rent for a month. Um, it's just so ripe for, for abuse. Um, and, you know, what I would say is if you feel you must do this, and, again, I'm completely against it, that you should set a limit one or two times a year, have a registry, whatever, where people, but do not, this will get out of control very quickly. And I think with home ownership, there comes responsibility to the neighborhood, responsibility to the community. And this is really tearing up neighborhoods. It's tearing apart our community. Like others have said, people are doing it, and they're doing it in Ojai. And, you know, they're getting around at this point already. Hopefully this new software, this new company will help. Um, you probably want to have a portion of it where residents can be, have a tip form of it where they can call in and say, hey, this is happening in my neighborhood. Here's the address um, so that it, it can help control them. But again, I think this one month exemption can be a big problem. And uh, I remember when Larry Stein, Gold, Goldstein, sorry, <laughs> got up at the last previous meeting and said people are going to abuse this. He admitted he had done it before, and when the one-month exemption came up, I saw him shaking his head and his eyes brightening up <laughs> by, well, okay, by, by how people are going to abuse it. So listen to him. He knows, okay, not here, but, but he knows the industry. So thank you. Thank you, Anita. Next, we have Larry Steingold, Jennifer, then Jennifer Fleischman, and and then Vicki Carlton Byrne. Um, Larry Steingold, resident citizen. Uh, <coughs> Short-term rentals and Airbnbs have essentially destroyed the residential housing market by causing them to be businesses. Um, you can enforce it. You can prohibit it, but it'll be like a dam with overflow. If you don't let something, some of them happen, then they're just, they're just going to continue to break the law. So if you treat them like businesses and tax them, just like a TOT, just like a hotel room, because if I go rent 30 days at the Ojai Valley Inn for ungodly amounts of money, you'll end up getting a TOT tax. So if I rent a, a, an a, a house here for three months, you should pay a tax. It's a business. Treat it like a business. Run it like a business. License it like a business. And you can solve some of these problems. Let them, t let them have a B&B B or whatever, or three months. And, but you have to have some exceptions. But you're going to have to enforce it. And having a snitch, I'd rather not go that way. I mean, if you have an inspector, you've got all these rentals. Let them pay for the salary. Let them pay for the benefits. You have a hundred rentals, charge them a hundred thousand dollars each to be able to have a, a rental that pays for the, the staffing. They have to pay a tax, they're licensed, and you just charge them. And if they make a mistake, 
you put a lien on the property and foreclose. You do whatever you have to do. Well, I mean, if you're going to stop it, you've got to stop it. I mean, you do it right. You use a hammer. You don't use a velvet glove. Right? But tax them. That's what I would do. Thank you, Larry. Next, we have Jennifer Fleischman, then Vicki Carlton Byrne, and then Wendy Hilgers. Hello, City Council. Um, thank you for your time. And also, I want to thank uh, Rachel and Betsy for meeting with us, um, myself and uh, Roseanne, this week. Um, separately. <laughs> uh, appreciate it, and I hope you uh, consider some of our points. Um, and that basically, you know, support strengthening the um, uh, enforcement of current short term rental law. I think that's important and that it should be uh, explored. And if these ordinance, if provisions in your ordinance um, reinforce that, that's great. Except for <laughs> the extension of the minimal rental term from 30 to 90 days. Um, I know that I've written several letters about this and made a comment and you know I have a tenant that rents and leaves during the summer and it would be a hardship for me to not have the opportunity to rent. I spoke to about a half a dozen other people who have similar situations that supplement their rent and this wouldn't it, this would not return housing if we were stopped from doing that this wouldn't return housing to people like Nora. Um, in fact I think you know, if you prevent that, what's going to happen is the there'll be a run on Miners Oaks where more and more investment or those those types of rentals will be filled up because it's legal there. So it's almost like creating a financial moat around Ojai where, you know, you will have to drive um, the need for lesser, you know, some, some people are not just tourists. Um, there's a couple, the need for rentals, you know, to other, other local towns. Um, there's a, uh, a couple renting across the street from us who uh, are in town for one month for cancer treatment. Um, you know, there's, there's situations like that, which I think if you, if you completely shut this down, um, if you change that ordinance, it, it, it shuts that. However, if you do decide to take it, um, to adopt it, then um, the exception D at least covers my situation. I don't think it covers all situations. Um, the, you know, I don't know if it applies to uh, standalone units um, but that's, you know, that was just a question. I did have a question for the legal, uh, legal team, though, and I brought, I, I don't know if you were able to see this letter. I, I sent it to the city manager. Um, but there's uh, Civil Code 4741 and AB 3182, which um, prohibits associations from adopting or enforcing uh, provisions that unreasonably restrict rentals, including requiring a mental, minimal rental period of greater than 30 days. So my question to the legal is, you know, have you, have you actually looked at that? Um, additionally, Honolulu was sued by, uh, they tried to do the 90-day minimal rental term and they lost, they had to pay 292,000 plus change back to the group. So I would say look at those first before, before changing the 30 to 90-day thing because I don't want the city to be in hot water again. Um, and please uh, at least have exception D in fact if you do. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, next, we have Vicki Carlton Byrne, then Wendy Hilgers, and then Starchild. Well, I can make this, <coughs> excuse me, shorter. Um, I agree with a lot of what's been said already. I have to say, though, after eight years of this, the proliferation of short term rentals has just been really depressing and disappointing. Um, we have, I just, happen to cross check some information that I had in the past two days and I found a tiny home that's on Airbnb that's one that was approved as an ADU where you specifically are prohibited from short-term renting an ADU that's operating in the city in the city limits um, an ADU um, approval was given to a person who is running a short-term rental it's like, like maybe the two or however many agencies or pieces of the city aren't speaking to each other. I think th there needs to be better coordination. Um, I've thought for a long time that the challenges and considerations of enforcement need to be driving the information and the, and the language that's used in the ordinance, not the other way around. Um, and I think it's, it's really important to know what staff can enforce before you create language um, to accomplish that. 
Um, I can answer your question, Rachel, about this, the county. In 2018, the county supervisors um, approved um, short-term rental, I don't know, ordinance or whatever it's called on the county level, that gave a special zoning overlay for the Ojai Valley, and that would run from Casita Springs out to the east end. It does not include Upper Ojai. So there was a two-year grace period for people to recoup their investments, and after that, I think it's July 2020, any freestanding, any um, you know, whole house short-term rental, any guest house short-term rental, any ADU, anything except a permitted, licensed home share is illegal. So all this stuff that's going on around us in the valley is illegal, and the county is doing apparently nothing to shut them down. So, um, you know, there's a lot of words in the ordinance already. Um, we don't need more words in this ordinance. We need teeth. We, need, we don't want them in compliance with language. We want them gone. We want them shut down. And if you've got a new company that can, can help with that, that's fine. Um, I just want to make a comment about that 424.04 um, paragraph D. I'm opposed to it. It's a, it's obviously a, a minority special interest carve out that I think is may even be well intended, but it's not going to work. It it leaves a whole bunch of loopholes. Thank you. Thank you, Vicky. Next we have Wendy Hilgers and then Starchild. Uh, through the mayor, Mayor Stakes, uh, Wendy just wanted to clarify that she intended to speak during the continuation of public comment. Okay. Uh, can we allow that? Oh, now? sure, of course. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, next, we have Star Child. Good evening. Um, I was very happy to see the carve out for month to month rentals. That's how my family was able to move to Ojai. Um, and, and I hope that that stays. Also, um, when I think about somebody who owns a house and is deciding maybe to build ADU in their backyard, um, I think that that doesn't really take housing. I if they build that ADU and they use it, it for short-term rentals, it doesn't really take away housing from other people. I think the most important part of the short-term rental uh, ordinance is to try and decrease the price of housing overall. I remember at the, the last time it was discussed, we talked about maybe a 7% decrease in the price of rentals, um, or at, rather that short-term rentals caused a 7% increase in rents. And I, I presume we think by taking away the short-term rentals, um, we'll get the price of housing down. Um, one of the most important tools we can, we can employ to get the price of housing down is to increase the supply by allowing more building. And I, I think you know having this discussion without acknowledging that um, leaves uh, a lot on side. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Thank you, Starchild. Any comments online? Yes, Mayor Sticks, we have two comments online. The first of which is Renee. Renee, your mic is unmuted. Good evening, Council. Uh, I would uh, like to support what um, Starchild said and also what Jennifer said. Um, I do believe uh, in the carve out. I think if people who aren't paying attention, who own property in this city, find out that they cannot allow somebody else to swap houses with them for a certain period of time, they will be outraged. So I like the carve out. I'm very appreciative that you were able to put that in and it was done in a thoughtful way. Uh, I don't think a lot of people are paying attention to this. I do agree short-term rentals are uh, reducing the available housing, but I think the limit should be 30 days. I think that's a reasonable time limit for people and it's even a, an excessive time limit. And you know, the other thing that I know is people who can't, we've had this happen with our, with our family members during the holidays. They can't find a place to stay here. So where do they stay? They stay down in Ventura. So what do they do? They drive back and forth from Ojai to Ventura, but because they cannot find a place to stay here that's reasonable and affordable. So they're putting miles on their car, they're adding, you know, greenhouse gases because we don't have enough 
affordable places for people to stay here. The other thing that I think you're doing, and I've seen everybody attacking STRs as if they are the villain, there are many people who are buying houses in Ojai and they are vacant. They're leaving their houses vacant. They're doing nothing to live in their houses. And some of them even share the ownership of the house, but that house is vacant. Vacant, vacant, vacant. I see a lot of them as I'm driving through town and you're doing nothing about that. So, you know, this is like one leg of a three-legged stool and you're putting many, many hours into this and it just seems unreasonable. Um, so I think you should do it. I think you should go with the county as Rachel was saying and do some kind of cooperative enforcement agreement and have it be 30 days like the county does and have an enforcement person that's easy to do it, whether it's in the city or the county. Thank you very much. Thank you, Renee. Next, we have Teal. Teal, uh, you can go ahead and unmute your microphone. Teal? All right, oh, now sorry. can you hear me? There you go, we hear you now. Okay, thank you. First off, well, it's me again. And STRs are banned in Ojai. Ojai was the cutting edge in 2016 at the county. I would highly recommend, yes, increase the fines. Yes, require disgorgement. Yes, place liens. Yes, private enforcement. And first of all, going back to my opening line, Yes, require disclosure to buyers that STRs are banned in Ojai. I would suggest taking money from the fines from the enforcement, putting it into an account and going from that. Keep it separate. Use that money separately. STRs ruin communities. At the county level, they allow home shares. It's in order to have somebody help with their taxes if they need financial help. So they rent out their room under the same roof. That's the law at the county. Council member Lang, it's your, you have to live in the same house and rent out a room. That's the law. What happens is the neighbors become cops and that's it ruins communities it completely deteriorates the loving vibe that ojai is okay and then one more thing i really want to add the one month exemption is a complete loophole and i think it's a huge mistake and i'm with uh what tara said about just just do away with all of it and just start enforcing and making money on that. And because STRs are banned in Ojai and have been since 2016. Thank you. Thank you, Teal. That's all. All right, we will move on to- Madam Mayor. Oh, yep. If I could make a couple of points, uh, to respond to a couple of questions raised. One is the city already allows and takes uh, resident or a neighbor complaints regarding short-term rentals. Those can be made through a phone call to the to staff, uh, coming to City Hall, an email, or through the My Ojai app. On the front page of the My Ojai app at the top, you click the um, start request, and then scroll down, and one of the request options is short-term rental or transient or vacation rental violation. So folks can put get that information to the enforcement team through existing tools, um, we have that now. Second is the Honolulu lawsuit is not a concern at all because the, there the trial court judge ruled that Honolulu's short-term rental ban ordinance shifting it from 30-day minimum up to a 90-day minimum violated a Hawaii state law. We're not in Hawaii. We're not subject to that. So no, no concern there. Second is Civil Code Section 4739 prohibits HOAs from requiring a longer minimum stay than 30 days. That does not apply to the city. The city is not an HOA. Uh, so that's an issue for condo boards, but not the city. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, who would like to begin discussion? Um, through the mayor, I just have a question for the city attorney. 
Um, we hear STRs, but STRs, we're talking about a minimum. I mean, it, it, we're ta when we say a, a short-term rental, we're talking about a, a minimum of one month, right? I mean... Under the present ordinance, yes. Right. So when everyone says short-term rentals, there's it's not just short-term rentals. It's short-term rentals of a month or less, right? I mean, I just think it's it's really important because what we're really talking about is short-term rentals for one month or short-term rentals for three months. Among other policy choices, yes. yes I think I the mean, issue may right. be that the community conversation is mixing up rentals of less than a month with one-month rentals. That is Under the current yes. ordinance, rentals of less than a month are prohibited and are short-term rentals. Rentals of a month or more are not defined as short-term rentals under the current ordinance. The council can ban those if they want, and that's the question. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate the clarification. Okay, who would like to begin? Uh, council member? Yeah. Yep. Go ahead. Um, so, I, I'm, I'm sorry. Microphone, please. Am I, is my mic on? No, it's not. Um, I spoke uh, about this, my, my <clears throat> what I'm about to say. I have discussed this with, um, with Vicki, who has been um, tracking short-term rental, Vicki Byrne, who has, um, I consider her the expert on the problem. She's been tracking short-term rentals since 2015. And, um, and I sent my questions to our city attorney. And I, I still need clarification, because from my perspective as a renter, uh, there are legitimate times when someone needs a, a rental for one month. And what I'm hearing is that we can still do that under the radar, of course, and not everyone is comfortable with that. And I'm also hearing that, um, that it's difficult to distinguish between a resident and someone who is doing this for a vacation. And from my perspective, if, uh, as a renter, you have a rental contract, one. You have a, rental, a very clear rental contract, whether it's for one month or, n or whatever, whether it's month to month or whether it's a lease. And it's very clear to me that anyone who advertises on a vacation rental platform is automatically uh, that, you know, that's, uh, uh, they're, an est they're, they're, uh, they're a vacation rental. And any of the, uh, of any of the, of the um, uh, criteria in this ordinance applies to vacation rentals, okay? I, I mean, what I'm trying to get at is that I'm still not understanding why it seems so difficult to distinguish between one month residential rentals and vacation rentals and I was told by our city attorney that we cannot require a, a landlord not to advertise on a short-term on a vacation rental I'm going to use the term vacation rental platform that's correct right we can't re require them not to that's not entirely what I said okay yeah clarification please yeah. Whatever minimum rental length the council sets, uh -huh. we can ban ads for less than that minimum length. Yes. But we can't control for a rental length that's legal where they advertise. Okay. But even so, that if uh, and a code enforcement officer sees that, that tells you, the, the code, it, it informs the code enforcement officer that this is something that needs to be looked at. Because if a no landlord is no legitimate landlord is advertising a month to month rental on a vacation rental platform, not necessarily. Well, I I I I, 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 I don't understand that. That's what I don't understand. So <laughs> one of many things. I don't typically, understand. landlords will advertise their a month to month residential rental on as many sites as they can. Okay. There are plenty of folks who will look to Airbnb for getting a month to month rental. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. So fair we, enough. Now what, what we can regulate is is what's prohibited, uh -huh. but where they advertise, as long as the advertisement is for a lawful rental length, we can't control that. We can control the length. So in other words, if the council sets the minimum rental stay at ninety days, 
uh -huh. we can enforce against any ad on any website in any way that is less than 90 day minimum stay. But we can't, we couldn't be able to. Okay. And if the council sets the minimum rental okay. length at 30 days. Okay, I got same it. Same thing. Yeah. I got it. I got it. Okay, so I wish we could mandate unfurnished. <laughs> Yeah, that would help. So, <laughs> unfurnished, only unfurnished. Fit furnished. Yeah. You, yeah. that's an option we could consider further. You can really. You can. You can. Enforcement gets tough, but it's possible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. I have to think about that. Um, let me see if there's anything else. I don't know how to. I don't know how to enforce that. Yeah, to be yeah, honest. yeah. I'm kind of joking. I'm kind of joking. I don't think you can. Yeah. So okay, while you're so looking, I, I have a follow-up. Let's, let's, sure let's make sure it goes. Let's make sure it goes through the mayor. So I, I, I think I was must must be naive because I really thought that, you know, landlords. I didn't realize that they advertise on an Air, Airbnb whether they're legitimate it, or not. It's not uncommon. It's not uncommon that if a if a landlord is looking for month to month tenants, there are websites now that will put you go and you I landlord click into it. And then it'll advertise on on every website possible. There's services that now do that as a as a pass through, which will include Airbnb and VRBO and HomeAway. Okay. And we see those those advertisements on the websites. And if they're for a place inside the city, and they're saying minimum rental stay 30 days, then that's legal. Okay. So so that leads me to my my next the the problem with with what some people call a a loophole, a can of worms, is that in order to establish a, that's a legitimate resident then you would have to get into um, uh, a, you know establishing that you don't have another house somewhere else that you have you know there has to be you know some some way to establish that this is just a, someone that's in between uh, you know that's maybe their house is getting remodeled who knows there's all kinds of reasons or they're a renter like me and they have to have a place to live while while they look for a long-term situation they need a temporary so why couldn't a rental why couldn't we require rental contracts that spell out uh, the criteria for establishing residency because that a, a rental contract usually does kind of require some language you know proof so that's doable that's what exception C would do yeah. Is exempt residential rentals of at least a month if the renter establishes a domicile at the rented premises. And there's a bunch of case law that defines yeah, domicile. Yeah, maybe we could strengthen that by requiring a, rent, a, a specific rental agreement. We could do that. I mean, we I, could I'm require registration of all rentals and then require a formal agreement to be used or substantially similar provisions thereof. That's possible. And that only is necessary if the minimum rental stay is set longer than 30 days. Yeah. I, I'm just to be clear. I'm in favor of all the ways that that, that you've listed uh, in the prior pages to strengthen it. My only concern is that I feel we need to be really careful that legitimate um, landlords are not worried that they're breaking the law, or that you know that it's just not a good feeling. And I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Mayor Pro Tem. Yeah, um, so this follows up on what Sousa was asking a little bit. Um, so you're saying there's a whole bunch of different platforms that can be used for advertising. Can we yes. require that they include within any advertisement of a Ojai rental that they have a statement that says that Ojai uh, has banned the use of, uh, you, you know, for a uh, rental of less than 30 days, and there are we've already there done are that. fines and penalties that um, attach to that. We can strengthen the language we have now, but we've already banned advertisements for a rental of less than 30 days. Right. We could add more words, and there's a bit of an issue with compelled speech, although we would argue that it's not that it's exempt from that because it's not political and it relates to operating a business which is less protected but um yeah we could improve the existing but we've already banned rentals of less than or advertisements rather of an unlawful rental so whatever the council defines as unlawful rentals ads for that are banned yeah so but, but my thought is a little bit different and it may have legal ramifications 
like you said, compelled speech. Right, that's one thing we'd have to but analyze if, a little bit. So we, you know, so we, we don't allow an advertisement, but can we require someone to state the law for short-term rental? Because I think what uh, community members, and actually I think I am concerned about as well, is that there's this uh, potential wink, wink, nod, nod, arrangement where you've agreed to a 30-day rental and then the rental only lasts two weeks and and the uh, you know reimbursement occurs so it, that that ban on the 30-day uh, less than 30-day rental doesn't exactly tell somebody who's renting I can't do this for less than 30 days Yes, we can compel the ads to also have a defined statement. We'll analyze closely the compelled speech piece, but as I said, I think it'd be okay under the commercial speech exemptions. Um, and that can be done as a re additional requirement for the ads. I'll note as a practical matter that will weed out a certain portion of renters. But I, it's worth remembering that zero is not achievable. It's impossible to eliminate every single rental. Just ask the federal government regarding several, several long-term pushes to solve other issues. We can't get rid of everything, but what right. we can do is get rid of most of them and cut down the supply as much as possible. So, yes, adding that language that says rentals must be 30-day minimum, rentals for less than 30 days, whether including— Violate city law. Right, and including that. rentals where you, mm -hmm. the documents are 30 days, but you actually only show up for two weeks, violate city law. That'll, that'll weed out a certain portion of people. Yeah, through, through the mayor. Oh, well, let's take turns. Okay. Um, um, I, uh, a couple of people made the comment, which I think is appropriate, which, you know, can we simply ban the idea of a vacation rental without attaching the days to it? Because the, so the 30 day, I think, is what, um, c creates concern that uh, it can be manipulated. Right. And so if you simply say, uh, like I, I read some, what some different cities um, are doing, and some of them simply say that a vacation rental is a, uh, is a commercial use and it is not permitted in any residential zone i like that now, <laughs> yes now, we can do that 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 raises enforcement a, of that is the challenge yeah but we can do it can we ban any residential any rental of residential real property for other than domiciliary purposes yes right can we enforce that that's the challenge Go ahead. So thank you. Through the mayor, if I could just jump in. So all this discussion it really just kind of hammers home that at one point. You can add in all types of stuff, but if you don't have somebody that's able to follow up and look for it, it doesn't really. Right. Then, then you are back to neighbors, you know, having to feel that they're the ones doing it. So I think I'm hearing an appetite for maybe some additional enforcement is what I'm hearing. Uh, I think. I will be advocating for your proposal that we dedicate uh, somebody to a, if not a full-time position, then uh, three-quarters time or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. is decided is best for uh, the, I guess it'd have to adapt to the problem, right? Yeah. yeah, I mean, right now we, the community development has a staff person that's dedicating about 25 percent of their time so that's, right it's full time so you're getting 70 75 percent that's not out there right now if you're right doing the numbers i mean they're enforcing other rules right <laughs> or or bringing or bringing items to planning commission which then they come long range coming planning through this yeah long projects range and commercial planning. projects exactly and, yeah. um so you know, I'm concerned about the two exemptions that they create more language and more um, potential um, loopholes to drive through. Uh, and I, I am concerned that 
if we go to 90 days, then we've got potential conflict in our short-term rental, not our, our, um, our uh, tenant protection rules which trigger at 30 days um, that then if we at, then if we make a at a 90 day period then we potentially it gets confusing to me uh, so I'm right with uh, council member Francina on that particular point so my thought is we stick with the 30 days um, because that's consistent with what we've put in our tenant protection and that we um, tighten up the language about what it is that we're prohibiting. And I am in favor of every single one of your enforcement tools that you've asked us for. And I wanted to make one um, refinement um, whether to require so the second one is whether to require disgorgement of unlawful rental revenues if higher than a standard fine and I um, I think we could potentially broaden that to include uh, equitable remedies so Injunction would be another equitable remedy. Um, and, and there may be others beyond that, that that I haven't, you know, thought of, but that just gives it a, a broader, broader base. So that's where I am. Okay, Scott, Council Member Lang. Yes, um, I... Uh, first of all, I think uh, I was thinking along the same lines as Council Member Fran as Francina and Mayor Pro Tem Whitman uh, about the 30 days. Um, our tenant protections have that as the minimum, and I think it would be really confusing to have a short term rental policy that extends beyond that 30 days. And also from my conversation with Jennifer and others, it just seems like that, um, you know, the people who are really following this uh, policy and following all the rules and having 30 day rentals, you know, they're, they're doing their part. Um, and, uh, and so I, I am in support of, of keeping that um, 30 days. I would like to make the language 30 days instead of one month. And that is for clarification. If someone uh, starts a rental in the middle of the month, 30 days is just a cleaner way of doing that. And, uh, and then I'm also in support of all these different, uh, when I read all these questions uh, in the staff report, yes, 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 yes. So uh, increase the fines, uh, uh, the disgorg uh, disgorgement or equitable, equitable remedies, all of these. Uh, I think would help to strengthen the policy. And I would also uh, see if staff could uh, find out what's happening in the county right now and if there is any way that we could collaborate with them or perhaps share resources for addressing the enforcement. And, um, and I think that is I think that is all, and then if, if we do the 30 days, then that would uh, eliminate the need for the exemptions. So I'm, I'm all for a clean policy, and, um, and, and so I don't think we would need these exemptions if we have that 30 days. Councilmember Rule? Um, yes, thank you, through the mayor. Um, so I, I am in support of keeping the 30 days. Um, if we were not able to do that, I, I really just wanted to speak about flexibility and the need for people who do not have a lot of funds but do have a house that they can rent out for 30 days and go see family 
or take a much needed vacation. Um, you know, these economic times are so hard for so many. And sometimes what they have is a house that they can either trade or share or rent out for a month. And when we take that sort of flexibility away from the middle class and the people that are having a tough time or this is the only way they can have a vacation or they can go visit a sick parent. Um, so I was very concerned that this sort of lockdown um, lack of flexibility would really affect people who need flexibility in these, in these days. Um, and a lot of people do need flexibility. They don't have a 3,000 square foot home. Um, you know, they don't have a lot of disposable income. We hear from a lot of people that actually do have that. Um, but we've also heard from people, and, and I appreciate this council immensely for taking that into consideration, that um, there are people that, you know, their quality of life is substantially changed because they can take in a, a home share or they can take in, they can, you know, sublet their place for a month. And it's not easy to, uh, to you know, really game the system. You can't pretend to live someplace. You have taxes you need to pay. You know, you have income taxes, you have property taxes, you have deductions. I mean, there's all kinds of ways that um, it doesn't allow you to uh, just simply wink, wink, nod, nod. Um, there are a lot of systems in place um, if someone wanted to look at them. And anyone who's going to game the system is going to look at that and know that, you know, they put themselves up for fraud if they do this for, you know, a not very much gain. But, but my main point is, is the flexibility and allowing those who need to have that flexibility with potentially the only real asset that they can barter with is their home. Um, given, you know, this day and age of wage decrease and productivity and the need to take care of parents and, and all these kinds of things. So thank you to this council, um, even if that wasn't the intent, but I think it's a great gift that we actually give to people that need it. Um, and for those online who have said this was self-serving for me, it's not self-serving for me. I can do whatever I want, whenever I want. So you can pull that back, um, and I'd appreciate it if you would. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank the council and the community and the staff, because I know this has been a long haul. We've worked on this a long time. Thank you very much, Mr. Siebert, for all your hard work on this. And Mr. Summers, um, <laughs> a lot of work. And um, I've talked to a lot of different people on this issue, met with a lot of different people, heard a lot, of, a wide range of opinions, um, lots of suggestions. I have worked really hard on this. And our question, the question is, what is the best decision for Ojai? You know, on the macro level, we know it's about housing supply and affordability. Um, and ADUs do, um, you know, their rentals. I have an ADU. I've rented it for many years to teachers and social workers and a dog walker. And um, that's providing homes for people who live and work in this community. Um, and then on the neighborhood level, it's about making sure that there are regulations to help ensure the quality of life of our residents. So I really want an ordinance that is clear and easy to understand and deters people from operating short-term rentals because we know that that hurts our community. Um, I think the proposed carve-outs are complicated and that we really need laws that are fair and simple and not unnecessarily complicated. So I went through the ordinance very carefully and um, I have seven suggestions that I think will make it stronger and better. Um, and I agree with our council members in that um, one month, sounds like we're all in, in, um, we're in consensus on the one month. Um, 30 days. 30 days, yes. yes. One calendar month, I'm gonna say. Um, no carve outs and yes, Mr. City Manager, we need enforcement because without enforcement, it doesn't mean anything. So if I can quickly just go through these seven um, changes. Um, if you could please look at page one. 
um, the bottom of page one, the last whereas. And I'm going to suggest that we use the term one calendar month and um, versus the 90 days there because uh, one calendar month is better because, um, as you mentioned, Councilmember Lang, this we have where we are. rent stabilization yeah. and uh, tenant protection ordinances that give occupants the rights as tenants of 30 days. This paragraph. Yep, this Thank one right here on page uh -huh. one. Yeah. Yep. What did you say you wanted to do with that paragraph? Um, Not less than three months. Uh, She's oh, changing to, that. To calendar month. And the, the reason the why calendar month is useful is because that um, you can start on the first day of the month. Every month has a different uh, number of days. So if we make it one calendar month and say it, it, someone's renting in beginning of or middle of September, it would depend on how many days September has. Um, because I'm cons does that make sense to you? Uh, well, somewhat. For when I look at my leases, they start April fifth, April right, you know, right. different times. So right. and then the rent is due thirty days. But later. back uh, so and back to the ninety days. We don't want to force people to take on renters because that's not our intent, of course. So we're re removing the three months and make it one calendar month. Okay, great. Okay. Then if you and could what o so what if we after saying calendar month we say parentheses thirty days. Well, what if it's February or September? Still 30 days. <laughs> well, uh, Mr. My City suggestion Street? would be to set it at 30 days rather than one calendar month because it solves the what when does the rental month start issue. And we all are under clear understanding that a month-to-month-to-month -to -month -to -month, month rental for February, although only 20 to 29 days, is not a short-term rental. Okay. All right. Um, and I would note that, that the last one on page one, which can be edited but is also a recital, okay. and thus not uh, – um, Just a recital. Thank you. Um, if we could look at page five, please. Uh, item C. Uh, we can. This is no longer necessary because there's no less than a month. So, um, which is not in the interest in com the community, the domicile, carve out. Um, this is on page five okay. of the ordinance. Of the um, ordinance. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay. Um, that's C. Um, so removing that. Can um, we think about, can we read it? Give me, give me just a second. I want to read it. Now, so. so what's the reason for uh, removing Because it? I think it's, it's there's, we shouldn't have any vocabulary in there about no less than a month because it's not in the interest of the community and that's where things can get abused. Um, can can, I'm can I ask a city attorney about this? I don't, it's, I'm reading item C page uh, five mm -hmm. domicile shall be interpreted consistent with the elections code doesn't say anything about the length of time does it I think my expectation based on the mayor's prior comments that she wished to sh wishes to wishes to shift it to a 30-day minimum stay is that when you delete on the next page subsection C where domicile is used then you no longer need the domicile definition Yes. On page six. On the prior page. So on the next page. Oh, okay. So on page six. It's gonna, it's gonna rem she's gonna remove this. Is that right? Yes. C. And I keep going. Uh, on page five, D. Um, can we add the words add or rent before the word fraction? any fraction so that someone with fractionalized ownership cannot rent if it's less than a calendar month. Um, so right at the third line, uh, has a legal right to occupy um, and or rent the home for any fraction of that year that is less because that would avoid that issue. I'm sorry, I'm lost. This is on D on page five. Where it says fractional vacation property. Uh, okay. Okay. So if we add on the third line, has a legal right to occupy and or rent the home for any fraction of the year, which means that, um, you know, if there are four people who own the house, they can't rent it out. Okay. Okay. Can I, can yeah. I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, would that would we also want to change the less than three months in that line uh, to to the one calendar month or thirty days? In D. Yes. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah. Yeah. So that changes and that would, to if the council sets it at 30 days, that 30 carries days? throughout. Okay. 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 Um, I'm, I'm getting there. Page, uh, same page five, uh, H. And so that would be unnecessary. If you remove the last line, um, it's unnecessary if the minimum stay is, is uh, 30 days. Okay, you're on page five. H. H. Okay. Okay. Uh, and the, the last line. This prohibition does not apply to one last member. It's because it be, uh, yeah, I'm just looking for a consistency. Um, Okay, then just three more on page six, section. Uh, move. Yeah, okay, uh, this part. That's just, that's just yeah, uh, just uh, removing yes. that sentence. I agree with uh, council member rule. It's just consistency because we're changing it to 30 days. And if I can, and Mayor, yeah. throughout the rest of subsection H, the same change, three calendar months deleted, put in less than 30 days. Okay, thank you. Um, I would note that one of the added provisions, the sentence before the sentence you're deleting, does pick up the situation where the rental agreement is for X period of time, but the actual rental is less. So that is picked up there. Okay. Um, and then on page 6, section 4-24.04, um, delete B, C, and D. Um, B is unnecessary if it's 30 days. Uh, C... You know, less than a month is not good, you know, for c our community. Right. And then D is unnecessary if the minimum stay is, is a month. Um, and then on page 7, section 4.-24.05, uh, penalties and enforcement, um, numbers, item C. Okay, that's the big one in the middle of page 7. Uh, can we replace the word or, and that's in the seventh line, with and before the word forfeiture? Um, because we want the opportunity to charge fines and disgorgement of profits, not one or the other. So that would be both. Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. And then the very last one, page seven, item G, we could remove item G and replace it with um, any aggrieved person or entity may bring a civil suit in an appropriate state or federal court to enforce any violation of this chapter. So I'm saying we should have the option to do it right away. We don't need 30 days to enforce it. I agree with that. Okay. And those are my seven suggestions. So I'm, I'm Ready to make a motion to pass the ordinance with those seven changes? I'll second it. I want to make a friendly amendment. Okay. That um, we have uh, staff bring back uh, language to be required in a rental advertisement that um, affirmatively states that a rental agreement of less than 30 days is uh, prohibited and may subject you to fines or penalties or. Okay, I'll accept that. Okay, well we have a motion and we have a second. Council Member Lang, yeah. Um, I have a question for the city attorney about that um, there, would I be correct in saying that there are First Amendment rights to commercial speech, though, that would preclude us from having that kind of language? The First Amendment protects commercial speech to a lesser extent than political speech, summarizing a fair amount of case law. The line is, is the activity being regulated lawful or unlawful? Um, I think we could take the position that requiring a statement of the minimum rental length is an acceptable regulation of commercial speech because we're saying that we're mandating that the the ad state what's lawful. Okay. All right. Well, we have a motion. We have a second. Any um, comments I before the roll call? Yes. Yeah, please. Council Thank Member. you. Um, so when this says any aggrieved person or entity may bring a civil suit, 
in an appropriate state or federal court. I mean, anyone can bring a suit anyway for anything. Um, I'm just, yeah, okay. I mean, I, I just feel like there should be, like, you know, I, I just worry about something like your neighbor thinking you did something and then they're gonna bring a suit and you have no choice in the matter but to have to fight this suit because they so chose or they misunderstood and then you're wrapped in a legal morass for a year or two. Um, you know, I, I there just seems to be, I don't know, um, it, it, it's, uh, it's upsetting to me that anyone can decide that you have broken, you know, the law and can, you know, sue you for this, even if you haven't, right? There's no investigatory process. Um, they can just bring a suit against you and you have no option but to deal with it. And, um, you know, that opens the door for all kinds of um, not only nuisance suits, but really vicious suits, right? And, and, and I'm just kind of worried about that. I'm just kind of worried about neighbors who get mad at each other, you know, or attorneys who are looking for, you know, employment, all these kinds of things. I don't know if there's a way to have standing or if there's a minimum uh, sort of evidence that you would need to provide to you know, the city to get, I, I don't think you could probably do that, to get some sort of verification that there had been something that went on. Um, you know, it's just another way that neighbors can, can inflict, if they, are so, if they so choose, pain on each other, honestly, with no, no basis whatsoever. So that's my, that's my only concern about this, you know, is these lawsuits that you have no choice but to have to defend because someone decided that maybe you might have done something. Um, maybe you need a little bit of evidence you know, or something, or maybe the city comes in as a co-something. You know, in, in, in some way, the city looks at the evidence and makes a determination since ultimately this is our law um, or our ordinance. I don't know if that's possible. Uh, but um, as someone who's seen <laughs> neighbors get really vicious with each other, and it's like they'll look for anything. I just want to. If it, if it, it um, I, I'm sorry. Through the so chair, yes. please. Yep. Yep. You're spinning. Yep. Do you want to uh, respond to that? Uh, yes, Madam Mayor. It's legal to to add something like that. It could be structured as a. Um, couple ways to one would be require that. A suit to enforce the city's ordinance has requires city consent, akin to how the attorney general um, enforces uh, incompatible offices doctrine, where it requires consent to bring the suit forward. Mm -hmm. um, another approach would be to restore the language that was removed in the mayor's motion, that would require a 30-day notice period and demand. That gets at it in part, but doesn't get at it in full. If the requirements say that somebody in the city thinks it's not frivolous to bring the suit forward, then yeah, you require the city consent of the suit. That would be lawful to add if the council so chose. I, I would like to amend the motion to include that, that the city, um, you know, validate the claims in some way um, because we require the city to validate, you know, other um, transgressions to this law. So I, I hope that my fellow council members would find that to be uh, an amenable, uh, friendly amendment. I, I think, I, I I think just, if a let's go through the main. Um, yep. Sorry. Okay. Um, do you want to start? Uh, go ahead. I was, going to, I was going to second the uh, amendment. Do we need a second? Uh, no, we just yeah. need to accept it, right? Yep. Well, um, it was posited by Councilman Rule as a friendly amendment if the uh, maker of the motion and the second of the motion do not accept it as a friendly amendment, then it can be made as an amendment. Okay. Well, let's, I'd like to hear so, from Yeah, I just wanted to mm -hmm. say that, um, I mean, lawsuits don't go on for a year if they're without a basis. Uh, in fact, you know, lots of lawsuits end 
very quickly when uh, the lawsuit's filed and the person who's being sued communicates what happened. Either there's a either there's a basis for a dispute or not. So, I mean, should the city weigh in on that or should a judge say, hey, there's not enough facts here, the case is dismissed? That's... Um, to the uh, mayor? Well, let's take turns. Um, yeah. Well, you know, when I lived next door to a neighbor whose dog barked all day long, in order for the county to even investigate, you have to have a letter from three other neighbors. They did nothing unless three other neighbors or two other, they had to have three neighbors in total mm -hmm. that would complain. I, I, I do think this is an important thing to consider carefully because we want we want to be really careful not, you know, there is potential, uh, you know, the, I, why did we remove the 30 days and why, I, I, I like the idea of the city being involved. This is, the city's involved already. This is, if it's a, the city's already involved. I ju um, we're, we're regular, you know, we're, we're banning short-term uh, vacation rentals is what we're doing. So the city's already involved. Mm -hmm. So it's not unreasonable uh, for the city to see if, if, if the, uh, the code enforcement officer to see if it's a valid claim some th or something like that. The, the I don't know quite how to word what I'm trying the to mayor? say. The most important thing is that, you know, we have private attorney general statute and that private citizens can regain the fees if they win. That's the most important thing. Um, and so, um, can, did you want to say something? Yeah, I'm, I'm worried about the city to being drug into yeah, and I would some dispute over whether there is a factual basis for the lawsuit or not. Usually the courts decide that. Council Member Lang. Yes, uh, so I, I, I actually I, I agree with Council Member Rule's um, uh, air of suspicion. Uh, you know, there, people can be mean to one another, they can be vindictive. If the dog's barking and they might wanna look for a reason to get back at them, there can be bad blood between people. Um, I, I, I think the 30 days written notice and demand, I think that would, that would serve as, the, as, a, as a clean uh, delay tactic in any kind of frivolous lawsuits or, or revenge uh, lawsuits um, instead of the city consent. Uh, I, I, I think, yeah, I, I think it's important though to, to protect to protect neighbors from neighbors. <laughs> I love my neighbors, but <laughs> you know. <laughs> Is that a friendly amendment? So, can we just get yeah, yes, yes. Council Member Lang. Yes. So okay. yes, my, I, I my mean, concern on said, the it's Council Member Rule's turn. Yeah. Um, I I would certainly accept the uh, amendment to my friendly amendment. Um, this is the also the language that we have in the rent stabilization precisely because of needing to make sure that um, there is good, I that there is true and good intentions. Um, uh, not true and good intentions, but that <laughs> there aren't bad intentions. You're just not trying to inflict, you know, trouble on your neighbor. My son refused to be a real estate attorney because it's all he said it's all about neighbors fighting each other and they will go to the death <laughs> over a fence um, and as, you know and as far as um, the judge you know determining it it can be months and months and months before your hearing comes to, to court and all of this time you're stressed and you're upset and you're having to talk to your attorney and even if there's nothing in the case then they appeal and then you're another six months waiting to be heard and more money. It, it, there can be nothing to it, and it can take easily a year. It, and most people who bring frivolous, these kinds of lawsuits, they're out for blood, you know, and they're going to take you as far as they can take you. And it also gives power to people who have more money because they can afford the attorneys. And 
um, even if you think you're going to get attorney's fees in the end, attorneys won't take contingency for this. So, um, you know, I think that the 30 days remedy and rectify keeps the, the uh, ordinance in, in uh, consistency with our rent stabilization. Um, I don't have a problem with putting the city in as having to decide if this is true or not. The city is already doing that. The city is the enforcement agent anyway. I mean, there's not to, <coughs> you know, they just simply have a finding, you know, <laughs> and they say yes or no. And this is something that, you know, uh, I don't know that it would embroil the city in anything other than they made a finding as they always do. The planning department is nothing but findings unless I'm you know, pretty much, you, you make findings. So um, I think that having the city involved is a, is a stronger protection. I would not object to your, uh, you know, the consistency of the language if that was where we ended up, but I really feel like we need to make sure before we move forward that before we put this on our, our, our people that they have some protections for bad actors. You know, a lot of, you know, you know. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that, that's, that's whatever, the, whatever the council thinks is a better, is a better so way to I'm go. Mr. That's City fine. Attorney, did you want to say something? Or no. I, we oh. wait policy direction, but I would note the last sentence of the present language in part is protection against a frivolous or meritless lawsuit. Okay. In that a def uh, defendant who, who was subjected to a suit that the court found frivolous and lacked any merit would recover attorney's fees. Okay. Mayor Pro Tem? Yeah, so if you put in this 30-day provision, you will not get any attorneys enforcing this. They will, uh, because you'll write a letter, and then the person will say, oh, I'm not going to do that anymore. And then they'll go back to doing what they were doing when the spotlight's off of them. There, there, there will be no attorneys. If we're trying to encourage an attorney to take on a case, Putting in that 30-day notice provision is going to kill their incentive. So if you want to, if you if you if you want to have some check and balance, then then uh, do it with the city as uh, examining the merits of the claim, as opposed to that 30-day notice provision. Okay, I will accept that as a friendly amendment. So. Are we ready for roll call? Well, Shelly, do you really uh, want to discuss? Well, I think sure. I think we're good for roll call unless you have something else to say. We're good with that? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So we're, just to be clear, we're going with the city, some review process by the city. Yeah, my, my one concern is creating more work for our staff. <laughs> so I'm looking at our staff <laughs> um, and and I'd like, you know, your opinion on that. Well, uh, Mayor, uh, I think there are um, hearings, maybe an appetite start for some additional funding for a resource to help with this effort. And I think you're just adding more reasons why you should think about that. So I think that if we do have an additional resource, and I would defer to the CDD director to think about what that might be, he doesn't have to answer right now. Um, yeah. That's probably acceptable. Okay. All right. Uh, roll call, please. Thank you, Mayor Sticks. So we have a motion from Mayor Sticks, seconded by Councilmember Lang, to pass item number two with amendments proposed by Mayor Sticks, Mayor Pro Tem Whitman, and Councilmember Rule. So if I may, just for clarity, why don't I summarize what Thank I understand to be the Thank you. adjustment. So it's introduced the ordinance as proposed with throughout changing the reference to less than three months to be less than 30 days in several places, deleting the exemptions that were in section 42404 subsection b c and d is unnecessary given revising the rental length to be less than 30 days deleting the definition of domicile is no longer relied on revising the definition of unlawful short-term rental to provide less than 30 days and delete the reference to um, domiciliary rentals and one month rentals by operation of law again unnecessary given the 30-day provision to provide that in subsection C of 424.05, its penalties are fines as stated and disgorgement of um, all rents and other gross revenue unlawfully received 
um, equitable remedies is already in there in subsections B and D, and to provide in subsection G that city consent is required before a private lawsuit uh, is brought, um, but delete the 30-day notice um, provision. That's what I understand to be the adjustments. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, Council Member Francina. Yes. I love when our minds work together. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Council Member Lang. Me too, and I do too, Council uh, Member Francina. <laughs> Mayor Pro Tem Whitman. Yes. Mayor Sticks. Yes. Council Member Rule. Yes. Motion passes 5 0. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Great you, Council. Um, well, we do have a public communications remainder. So we have Wendy Hilgers. <coughs> Thank you so much. I was sitting at home watching the city council meeting as I always try to do, and I knew that I couldn't let the night pass without coming to honor the life of a woman who gave so much to Ojai, Nancy Hill, passed away today. She was one of the kind of women who always wanted to help and always did help. She never refused somebody. If she couldn't do it, she found somebody who could. She was the, the guiding light for the Memorial Day celebrations every year, year after year, gathering people together to help, people to entertain, to honor all the military people who had passed away or were still on duty. She was an incredible inspiration, even at her work. She was sometimes the main conduit that her clients had to see what was happening in the city. They had no other outlet. So she was active in every part of their lives. And I just wanted to say, she touched the lives of thousands of people here in the Valley, and thousands of people will remember her in a wonderful way. And I had to come and say something. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Wendy. Thank you very much. Any comments online? We have no comments online. Okay. All right. Well, we will move uh, on to closed session. We have two closed session items, a uh, conference with real property negotiators, negotiators and conference with legal counsel existing litigation anything to report out mr city Attorney? yes thank you madam mayor the council will be meeting to consider the two items listed one uh conference with real property negotiators regarding 408 north montgomery street uh for the habitat for humanity project no reportable action is expected tonight uh, direction is expected regarding the price and terms of the deal and the approval for that project will come back in open session um and then for the existing litigation, it's the Santa Barbara Channel Keeper versus State Water Resources Control Board, City of San Buenaventura versus Abbott case. Uh, there it is, this is the water lawsuit and we're not expecting reportable action, but an update regarding the ongoing uh, discussions. Thank you. Thank you and we will adjourn to closed session. And I wanna thank everyone for being here. I assume you're not gonna be waiting for us when we get out. So have a good <laughs> night. Thank you. Thank you.